recognition of guests, the Deputy Premier. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You look mighty dapper and for the, <laughs> the first day of the summer sitting today, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to welcome everyone to the proceedings uh, here in person and online. And uh, Mr. Speaker, we have lots of guests here uh, in the gallery today, and I want to say uh, welcome to everyone. I know many of you are here to hear the House statement that I'm delivering later, and uh, I look forward to that announcement. Today is the first official day of summer, and the forecast is calling for a beautiful day and some summer solace, so I uh, hope Islanders get out and enjoy it. It's, uh, it's a perfect heyday. Today is also National Indigenous Peoples Day, a day to recognize and celebrate the history, heritage, resilience, diversity of our Indigenous peoples. There are events uh, taking place in communities across the island to mark this day and, and to celebrate. Also, Mr. Speaker, I want to welcome and congratulate uh, Ghislain Bernard to becoming the new superintendent of La Commission Scolaire Langue de Francais. Uh, you got big shoes to fill, Ghislain, but uh, I'm confident uh, you are the right person for the job and you will do a fantastic job. And finally, and finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate Jeremy Wall on capturing a gold medal this morning in the 1500 meter run in Berlin at the Special Olympics World Game. We are very proud of Jeremy and uh, PEI is cheering you on and uh, you and your teammates. So congratulations, Jeremy. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to stand today and welcome those who are watching online and those who are joining us in the gallery today. And it's, uh, in particular, I, I think it's the first time this year I had someone, a uh, constituent from District 27, and it's Nancy Peters Doyle. Welcome, Nancy. Nancy was a recipient uh, this uh, earlier this spring of the uh, Queen's Jubilee Medal. And uh, she's an Indigenous educator, a member of the Provincial Anti-Racism Racism Table, a community volunteer. I worked with Nancy on many years with the Irish Moss Festival. Uh, she works tirelessly to empower Indigenous youth to reach their full potential while also fostering um, allyship among students, colleagues, and in the general public. So, so proud to have her here today. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, following on that today, as mentioned, is National uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, and that's a day for all Canadians uh, to recognize and celebrate the unique, the unique heritage, uh, diverse cultures, and outstanding contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, and we should all take uh, a step towards reconciliation by learning about Indigenous peoples and their history. And there was many uh, uh, celebrations today held across the island. There's one over here at Confederation Landing that will t go on until 4 p.m. today. So I invite anybody, um, to, uh, not everybody, everybody to get out uh, and explore different places on the island, like uh, I mentioned Confederation Landing. There's also something in Scotchford, in Indian River, and in Cornwall, and there's other communities across the island that are helping to celebrate. And I just want to, uh, while I'm on my feet, uh, I guess on behalf of myself and my Acadian heritage, uh, thank the Mi'kmaq people of Prince Edward Island for their, um, and, and, and recognize their um, collaboration in the past and all they did to, to help us over the years. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I too would like to start by welcoming everybody to the gallery. What a beautifully large and wonderfully diverse group of people we have in the gallery today, starting with Nancy Peters Doyle. Lovely to see you, Nancy, and Stephanie Arnold sitting beside you. And in the back row, I see Bethany Colick at McNabb and Gerard DeVoe. So nice to see you as well, amongst others. Welcome, welcome to you all this afternoon. And indeed, National Indigenous People's Day is a very important day um, in the life of Canada. And I'm blessed to know many, many Indigenous Islanders, and they've taught me so much about Mi'kmaq history, Mi'kmaq culture, Mi'kmaq heritage. And in particular, I, I, want to, I want to say hi to a constituent of mine, Senator Ryan Francis, who lives um, in Rocky Point. And I value uh, Senator 
Francis's friendship deeply and all of the things that he has taught me over the years. And uh, we are so lucky as a province to have him as one of our four representatives, three currently, four representatives that we, we typically have at the, this, the Canadian Senate. And I think we're at a really pivotal moment in the relationship between Indigenous peoples and settlers here. And, you know, I've been absolutely delighted and thrilled to see some tangible, real tangible um, progress made in, here in Abiguit and indeed across Turtle Island when it comes to relationships between settler peoples and uh, indigenous people. But I'm also acutely aware of the sensitivity and the precarity of the time that, that we are in here. You know, so much has been forcefully taken away from the original settlers of this land. But for me, their deep, sincere, spiritual connection to the land is something that has always remained. And I think we as settlers would do well to listen to the wisdom of indigenous people when it comes to that and to follow their, their sorts of understanding about the relationship that we have with Mother Earth, because I, I sincerely believe that our collective future may well depend on that. So happy Indigenous Peoples Day to all. Yesterday in Crapo, the, the Daro Guignon Memorial Park was opened. And I was so sad not to be able to attend that, but uh, for lots of reasons, but particularly because Daryl was a dear friend and a constituent, again, of mine in District 17. And there's nobody on Prince Edward Island who loved and, know, and knew the, uh, the waterways of our island as, as much as Daryl did. And you know, he was a lifelong champion of preserving our rivers, our streams, our estuaries, our, our waterways and wetlands, as well as our forests. And it's a really fitting tribute for him to, for us, to have um, dedicated uh, a place in Crapo in his name. And my thoughts are with Rosie McFarlane, um, again, a dear friend and a wonderful islander who does so much work for the environment and for our rivers and fisheries here on Prince Edward Island, um, his, who is, of course, his widow and his family. Upstairs, um, on the second floor, there's a feller who's been with me for uh, five years in this house. Um, and for the first couple of years when I got elected here, I, uh, I sort of navigated the, the turbulent and sometimes treacherous waters of this legislative assembly with only one staff. And then came along a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, brilliant and funny thing um, fresh out of UPEI called Nathan Hood. Um, and with all of the changes in our office, uh, Nate's last day will be very soon, either today or tomorrow. And, and he will be greatly missed by everybody in our office. Nate is going on to study law at UNB, but he's not leaving the PEI legislature quietly. He'll be, he'll be going out with a bang as a stranger on the floor later today with um, Charlottetown Victoria Park's bill on the amendment to the Ombudsperson Act. And like so many pieces of legislation and work that we have brought forward from our office, from the Green Caucus, Nate was often the chief researcher and the principal author of draft bills, and that's true for the one that we will hopefully be debating later today. And Nate, uh, you are much loved and you will be much missed. Uh, finally, uh, Olivia McNeil, who is sitting with us today, has done an awful lot in her short time on this earth. She's a grade 12 student at Tosh and a page in the legislature. And she has won many awards and done some extraordinary things. She was a 2022 Youth Volunteer of the Year Award in Summerside. She's a great student academically, um, but she's, uh, as was laid out in the article in today's Guardian, something that was really worth reading for those who have not seen it. Um, she feels that being a well-rounded person is, is more important. And I, I really appreciate that from one so young to have understood that. She's smart and she's kind and she's dedicated to her community. And she has a, a deep spiritual life as well as part of that roundness of character. Um, here, she's politically, she is a page in this house, and she actually took on the official duties of the clerk briefly one day, which I don't think I've ever seen another page do. Um, she's going to UPEI next year for a four-year undergraduate program and wants to be a teacher because, as she says, she wants to inspire others. Well, I think you're already doing that, Olivia, and it's lovely to have you here, and I wish you all the best in your future. Thank you. Member for Charlottetown West Royalty.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a great pleasure to rise and say hello to everybody from District 14 and um, wishing everybody a, a happy day. I know there's some happy uh, Colonel Gray. Uh, they had a great uh, event last night for the prom and uh, wishing everybody all the best there. And I want to say um, it's, it's, a, it's a special day here today um, with uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day. And I want to say uh, to Nancy Peters Doy, welcome. This is this is. Uh, I'm glad you're you're doing the work that you're doing, and you're and you're here. And and I, I notice and I see you, and I, I I value everything that you've done for Prince Edward Island. Um, the, uh, there's some members of the gallery here too that that are that are pretty pretty important. And this is a this is this is a special day um, because of the table and the work that they've done. I want to thank everybody on that table. And um, I'll be speaking to this later, but uh, Malak Nassar, you've done an incredible job. Your, your conversations with me have inspired me, and, and you're a bright talent. Um, um, Victor, you're, you're, you are an up-and-coming star in this province, and I want to thank you for everything that you've done, taking on the space that you have. Stephanie Arnold, to chair something like this for the first time, it's been incredible to see and to guide this incredible work that will shape our province for years to come. I want to thank you for that. Letty La Rosa, what can I say? I've had conversations with you for years and years. You were taking up this space and, and providing opportunities for others well before, well before we even discussed this stuff. So thank you for, for championing this. And to my friend Dante Bizard, the work that you're doing, the work that you're doing, how you're changing our province is incredible and it's you are my inspiration along with everybody else so I just want to say thank you and a special greeting it's not often that we have BIPOC black indigenous people of color um, on an indigenous day and they're taking up um, they're here and you represent most of the gallery and I thank you for being here it's gonna be a great day. O'Leary and Vernis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too want to uh, recognize uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day, and I had the opportunity to actually uh, stop in Lennox Island on my way to the legislature, uh, as obviously the Lennox Island is, uh, are my constituents, and I believe I represent the largest Indigenous population in Prince Edward Island in my riding. And uh, so at the Lennox Island Cultural Centre, they had all kinds of festivities going on. Uh, there was smudging, ceremonies, games, uh, drumming, dancing. And the special part of it for me was to get my annual picture with uh, Michaela Bernard and her auntie Bethany Culligan McNabb is here and I think Be uh, Michaela is uh, on her way to Charlottetown at the moment to dance a little later on. And uh, also had a great chance to have a good chat with uh, Chief Bernard and go over a few of the issues that this government doesn't seem to be addressing on Lennox Island. So I said I'll uh, certainly be making sure that I uh, represent them as best I can in this provincial legislature. And encouraged her to actually read Hansard because there's a number of questions that were brought up and some uh, she may be able to get an indication where uh, this government is heading on indigenous issues. So with that, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. The member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and hello to my colleagues and everybody tuning in from Charlottetown, Victoria Park and all around the island. And a very special welcome to everyone joining us in the gallery today. It's really nice to see you and thank you for being here. Um, as was mentioned a few times, um, it being National People's Day, and it was a pleasure this morning to bring greetings on behalf of the Honourable Leader of the Third Party this morning at the event at Confederation Landing. And when I was there, I, I had a cold like three months ago now and ever since I get these random cough attacks and of course it's when I'm sitting on the stage waiting to get up to speak that one of these things <laughs> take over and I so I went off the stage so as not to be too much of a disruption and um, Sarah Jackson I saw her coming from far away in the crowd and she locked eyes with me and she came over and she said you look distraught and I said I explained to her what happened and she got me some water and I thanked her for seeing me and um, isn't that just kind of a, a typical experience that that you have um, in when you're at events such as this and and as the uh, honorable leader of the official opposition honored his Acadian heritage and I'd like to take a minute to do the same as well um, my mom's family is uh, Perry Arsenault from Tignish and uh, my cousin actually worked at um, the uh, the D oh my gosh I forget what it's called in Acadia Acadia University. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. I'm having a bit of a 
anyway, the, the um, deportation site of the Acadian people um, in Nova Scotia. And um, so she was a historian there, and so is just a wealth of Acadian um, history and, and information. And one of the dearest things to my heart is the fact that um, when we were, our ancestors were living in Tignish and the French or the English would come, it would be the Mi'kmaq people who would be there to keep the Acadian people safe. And so without the Mi'kmaq people, um, Acadian people in PEI wouldn't have stood much of a chance, and, and I'm sure that goes for, for around, around um, Turtle Island. So um, also today, Mr. Speaker, Michelle Patterson in our office as well, another brilliant mind and really funny personality, and I just appreciate everything about her. And uh, she will be, today is her last day, she'll be coming back with us in the fall, but, um, but for now she's, uh, she's going to enjoy, enjoy the summer with her family and, and do some other, enjoy some other uh, work adventures. So with that, happy Indigenous Peoples Day, and I hope everyone enjoys the proceedings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, welcome to everybody. Welcome to our guests in the gallery. Um, I just wanted to rise for a few minutes to uh, to recap a bit of my uh, day so far, and uh, I'll start uh, to uh, just prior to this and work backwards. I too was uh, in attendance at uh, Confederation Landing Park for the celebrations of uh, National Indig Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I was there to bring uh, greetings on behalf of the Premier who is, who is uh, not here today. And I, was, I felt very privileged and honoured uh, to be there. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity before the, uh, the event uh, got started to, to speak with uh, Native Council of PEI um, President Lisa Cooper and to have some discussions about some of the partnerships uh, that we have with, with their organization, uh, such as the, uh, the men's shelter that we opened in partnership in Summerside. We had some discussion about, um, about their participation in the um, coordinated access program and uh, the HIFA system, which uh, we use in response to the homeless uh, situation here in, on PEI. So that was, uh, I, I was uh, very happy to be there. Prior to that, um, I was at the Murchison Center and uh, brought some greetings there uh, to a group of our community partners, again, who are there for a two-day workshop to discuss the coordinate, coordinated access model that we're using, again, in response to our homeless situation. Um, uh, I was happy to see that. Uh, we're building that capacity and learning from, uh, from our experience with that and improving how we respond again to that situation. So uh, I wish them well and um, uh, I look forward to growing that community and uh, imp continuously improving our response. Uh, prior to that, a couple of routine meetings, but my, my day really got started at 2 a.m. this morning when my alarm went off to, uh, to uh, head out to the uh, Bredalban area in the countryside to pick up a group of uh, Colonel Gray grads, including my son, who were there to, to celebrate their graduation. Uh, there may have been uh, someone in this room that uh, I was ferrying home. And uh, <laughs> I, I did the same last year, and it's always it's great to see... <laughs> It's great to see how well organized uh, these celebrations are and how, uh, you know, frankly, quite responsible uh, some of the, uh, the celebrations are. Uh, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into these celebrations on behalf uh, by the parents. Um, there was a steady stream of traffic on Route 225, uh, picking up, dropping off, um, celebrating students. And, uh, you know, it's just remarkable to see how well organized and, and frankly, safe it is compared to how it may have been in my day. Uh, and uh, I was really happy to do that. I picked up a bag of cheeseburgers, uh, on, and uh, that was a think appreciated on arrival, and uh, got everyone home safely. And so uh, that was... Um, uh, a really great uh, event, but uh, I was also there at uh, Confederation Center last night as my son uh, was uh, marched in to the uh, to the center and celebrated his um, his graduation. I have to uh, I have to uh, do a little humble bragging here that I'm so proud of him with the marks that he graduated with. He's a very very good student who works very hard. I've always told him that it's not the marks I care about, it's the effort, and he worked so hard this year. Uh, and he, he came out with an extraordinary result, so I'm extremely proud of him, and uh, thank you very much. Look forward to the proceedings today. Mm -hmm. 
Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I wasn't going to rise today, but somebody snuck into the gallery without me knowing. My uh, father is actually in the gallery today. <laughs> so I am confused. It's a sunny day. <laughs> and uh, there must be a tournament at Fox Meadow, and he couldn't get a tea time. <laughs> so he decided to come in here. <laughs> I doubt that will happen. Um, also, uh, my dad is actually my unsolicited advisor. I get a lot of unsol unsolicited advice from him, and he says in the last, this last few days, my tie hasn't been snugged up tightly enough because of my sling, so I'm, as soon as he walked in, I gave my tie a little tug and made sure it was, uh, it was tight today. Also, I want to have a shout out to Jennifer Sanderson, a good friend of mine who was away having, if I pronounce this right, cochlear implant surgery today. So, Jennifer, we're thinking of you today, and I hope everything goes well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Statements by members, starting with the member for O'Leary Inverness. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the great work offered by the Career Bridges Program under the umbrella of Tremploy. O'Leary, Summerside, Charlton, and Montague have three intakes every year with approximately 12 participants. Those in the program are able to take advantage of the curriculum that has been tailored to meet the needs of persons who have had challenges succeeding in today's ever-changing workplace. Career Bridges is a 12-week career exploration opportunity with a six-week component of class and assessment-based training to identify career interests, identify potential employers, deal constructively with career barriers, and some barriers include transportation, workplace literacy, interaction with coworkers, interview and resume skills enhancement, and many other issues. Once workers have completed their classroom initiatives, they have the opportunity to try six weeks of on-the-job training where participants can be placed at two or three different work sites should they want to. They also get the support of monitoring by the program instructors to help clients understand the skills that they have learned in a real work setting. This better prepares participants for the transition to a real work experience upon completion of the program. Recently, 11 participants completed the Career Bridges program in O'Leary, uh, including five constituents of O'Leary Inverness. And I want to personally congratulate Pam Corcoran, Bradley Dara, Heather Biot, Cass Alder, Ashley Lewis as I was unable to attend their closing ceremony on Friday due to legislative commitments. I want to recognize these constituents for the great leap forward for their vocational situations. Great work. I would like to also thank Mary Lou Rogers and Nancy Hamill, uh, the program instructors, for their considerable success over the years in assisting those with employment barriers to enter the workplace career of their choice. I also want to recognize that Career Bridges is located at the Future Tech West location where Skills PEI and Career Development Services were all located. This proximity to each other provided extra supports to those attending Career Bridges when it came to issues of course funding or other bureaucratic issues that arise during their time in the program. It is indeed unfortunate that this may be the last program that will, this will happen with government's callous and ill-informed decision to relocate, relocate those services away from Future Tech West. <laughs> Member for Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to highlight a special event that's taking place this weekend. It's Make a Move for Scleroderma. Make a Move for Scleroderma is happening on Sunday, June 25th at Victoria Park. It consists of a run and walk. There will be snacks and refreshments and other related activities. The funds raised during this event are used to help individuals living with scleroderma, including the David Shea Memorial Patient Support Fund, which is financial assistance for those with expenses as a result of their disease. In 2022, myself and the former Minister of Health attended the Scleroderma Atlantic successfully, raising approximately $60,000 through five, event, five events across Atlantic Canada, which also included the inaugural event here in Charlottetown. The kickoff of the event will begin shortly after 12, and the walk uh, or run will follow at 12.30. Scleroderma, Mr. Speaker, is also known as hard skin. It's a rare chronic autoimmune disease that forces the body's immune system to attack its own tissues and can lead to hardening and tightening of the skin and damage to internal organs. Scleroderma is life-threatening, life-altering, and without a cure. Scleroderma Atlantic aims to help those affected by the disease through awareness, promoting health and wellness, and fundraising, for programs and patient support. I do want to especially recognize an amazing Scleroderm Atlantic volunteer that happens to live in my district, Barbara Carter. Barbara is an active volunteer and a board member who has been involved with the organization for many years and is challenged every day by living with Scleroderma. 
I do want to thank you personally, Barbara, for your dedication and exceptional advocacy in bringing awareness to this rare, life-changing disease. And I want to thank you and all the dedicated volunteers who give their time so generously to Scurloderm Atlantic. I was hoping to see you here today, but I will definitely see you on Sunday afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Surrey, Elmira. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I asked questions to my colleagues across the floor on the situation concerning ferry service between Wood Islands and Caribou. They share the same concerns that I have, and we are worried, especially my counterparts in the East. Mr. Speaker, my questions need not be directed at the ministers in our provincial government. My questions need to be directed at our federal government, the federal minister of transport, and our federal liberal MP, Lawrence McCauley. This issue and the need for a replacement ferry is no surprise to anyone. In 2017, the federal government issued RFIs for companies interested in taking over Eastern Canada's ferry service on a permanent basis. In that request, a new vessel was deemed absolutely necessary. In 2017, Minister McCauley made an announcement at a small community centre in Belfast, Prince Edward Island, just a few minutes up the road from the Wood Islands dock that he was pleased that the Government of Canada is seeking long-term contracts to provide stability and certainty in the communities of Prince Edward Island, which in turn will stimulate our economy. In 2017, Mr. Speaker, the Federal Government plan stated that three out of four ferries on the three routes in Eastern Canada would be replaced over the next three years. Again, in the 2019 federal budget, there was reference to a new ferry to replace the Holiday Island. My question to the federal government and our federal Liberal MP, where is our replacement ferry? So Mr. Speaker, my questions and comments are to our federal counterparts. The time for RFIs is over. It is a simple equation based on numbers you already have. Ask the shipbuilding industry for a design to build a ferry between Wood Islands and Caribou. No ice breaking capabilities are necessary. Expected traffic flows are all known. The government knows exactly what we need. And the shipbuilding industry could have a vessel built in 24 months. And yes, I have confirmed that with a boat building firm just this morning. Minister McCauley has been a voice for our ferry service for years, but a voice is not enough. We need a strong voice, one that is willing to put himself in front of the right people and stand up tall for Kings County and Prince Edward Island. So Minister McCauley, if you are listening to this, as our federal minister, you have the ability to carry this file directly into Cabinet and have had that ability for the last six years to get approval from Cabinet and to go before the Treasury Board. Has this been done? I suspect, Mr. Speaker, the answer is no, but if it has, just call the tender. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that this government permitted online gambling here in Prince Edward Island, despite uh, the fact that experts at the time stated that it could, in fact, make gambling addictions worse for those who live with addictions. So we know that the uh, predatory nature of gambling often targets individuals who are already struggling. So question to the Minister of Health. Does your department maintain any sort of data on how many, on how many islanders are living with gambling addiction, and how do you keep track of that information? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, very relevant to me as well as I was in finance uh, for a few months and, and where the gambling sometimes does fall uh, in both departments. So again, we look forward to the responsible gaming strategy that will come out soon. And again, I think it's important that we look at this issue. The prevalence of gambling is, is quite remarkable especially over the last few years and we need to address it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I didn't answer either one of those questions, so I'll try another one. So at that time, the online gambling was permitted and authorized by this Conservative government in 2021. Seven members of the current government were around the cabinet table when that came time to sign off and permit online gambling, gambling in this province. So question to the Minister of Health. Uh, 
So since uh, first joining government, like you mentioned, you were the Minister of Finance, who oversees Atlantic Lotto, and now as Minister of Health, mm. have you ever questioned your colleagues on why they cho chose to pursue online gambling in this province, despite the negative impacts it can have on the lives of Islanders and on their families? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. It is a very important question. Uh, one thing with our partners at ALC is they do have a responsible gaming strategy. So do we do have tools in place with ALC to self-regulate? So I think that's important in our industry with these offshore gambling sites. There isn't security, so there's increased risk for our gamblers. So again, the responsible gaming of ALC is an important component of delivering that service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you Mr. Speaker, um, everyone in this room knows someone who suffers with a gambling addiction. And the reality is, it's a pervasive disease that gets less attention than drugs and alcohol. So there are no physical sim uh, symptoms to gambling, um, like, there is, uh, there, like there is associated with drugs and alcohol. It's harder to spot and therefore harder to identify and harder to resolve. As this government is supportive of increasing access to gambling options for those who might be suffering, education and early intervention um, seemingly, or is seemingly the last tool available to us to stop, um, to get ahead of the gambling addiction, Mr. Speaker. So, question to the Minister of Education. Uh, what educational materials is taught in our school on the topic of gambling addiction, and at what age does that begin? The uh, Minister of Education and Early Years. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Certainly an area that I am concerned about as um, both Minister and as a mother. So uh, as it relates to materials within our school, as you can imagine, our, our curriculum is broad. Um, our department recently developed, piloted, and implemented a new physical and education health uh, curriculum for our grade nine to seven to nine students, as well our wellness course, uh, Mr. Speaker, which is mandatory for all of our grade ten students. Certainly helps our students to develop um, positive relationships and healthy decision making, Mr. Speaker. And through our health curriculum outcomes, we continue to teach our students about the harmful effects of substance use, addictions, and how to develop healthy relationships uh, and refusal skills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I didn't see anything in there specifically for gambling addictions, and it's a very serious issue, and it needs to be, there needs to be an education component at a very early age uh, to teach these uh, children at that time. So, Mr. Speaker, online gambling and sports uh, betting in, in particular are frequently advertised uh, in our province, typically with flashy commercials that feature various celebrities. Atlantic Lotto, of which PEI is a governing member, promotes Priceline as their online sports betting platform. Question to the Minister of Finance. How many Islanders gamble through ALC's Priceline platform in an average year, and what is the average amount an Islander will bet through this platform? The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's not information I have on hand here today, but that's definitely something I could take back. Thank you. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In Atlantic Auto's most recent uh, report, their sports revenue took a jump of $3 million in 2022 over 2021, from $11.8 million to nearly $15 million. So year after year, we are seeing increasing amounts being spent on these gambling plat plat platforms, but addictions funding doesn't seem to be keeping up. Question to the Minister of Finance. How much of the addiction services budget is earmarked for gambling addictions in this province? The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we'll be tabling our budget here, I think, um, today or tomorrow. I know that there's an operational piece that goes to the Health and Wellness Department of $500,000. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The budget was tabled several weeks ago. Um, while a $3 million increase to sport betting revenue is a large increase year over year, it pales in comparison to the increase in revenues to online betting or iGames uh, revenues, which came in at close to $77 million last year. That's an increase, an increase of $33.7 million in online ga um, gambling revenues. So question to the Minister of Finance. How much of the $76.9 million from online gambling revenues wound up in the government of PEI's coffers? The Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, um, I believe that th we average about, about $25 million. We get the net profit out of that, and it's about, I think, $25 million that we receive out of that. Leader of the Opposition. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. While online gambling revenues increase, we can't ignore the amount of money that changes hands at VLTs, particularly at Red Shores Casino in Charlottetown and Summerside. So huge sums of cash being withdrawn by gamblers on, on a site who continue to pump in paychecks worth into these VLTs. So question to the Minister, can you tell the House how much money Islanders spend uh, on VLTs at Red Shore facilities on an average day? The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I believe that in this past year, I'm going to say that there's somewhere in around 13 to 14 million dollars, and I'll I'll confirm that um, just to give you a ballpark. Um, but yeah, it's something I can take back. Maybe what I'll do is that's a ballpark that I'm thinking might be the right number, but I'll confirm that for you and bring it back. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it was very important to, to have that number and have that correct number. Um, Mr. Speaker, as we've seen uh, from this government, especially when it comes to issues that involve Islanders suffering, um, there's very little information or data being collected that would help us measure how many Islanders are or are not using a particular service. Question to the Minister of Finance. Does your department track how many Islanders are using Red Shore facilities or VLT or gambling purposes in a given day, a month, or a year? And if so, can you provide us with those details? The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm not sure on those exact numbers, and I, I can say I'm not even sure if that's specifically tracked, but if it is, that's something I could bring back to the House. Thanks. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you this. Uh, it would appear that this government is padding budgets and spending at the expense of Islanders who are suffering from gambling addictions. So question to the Minister of Finance. Do you believe the trade-off of increased gambling addiction, increased numbers of Islanders suffering from the disease, and an increased exposure to our youngest generations to new flashy gambling platforms is actually worth the money, given that you are spending so little on combating gambling addiction here in Prince Edward Island? The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is something that we absolutely um, will and can monitor uh, moving forward. Um, I think they have been monitoring it, but we'll continue to do that. Um, I think the goal here is to ensure that there is a responsible gambling piece um, integrated with this industry, um, and that's what the government of PEI is looking to do. We're not looking to bring on new gamblers. We're looking at ensuring that the 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 people that are playing the games are in a regulated space that protects them in some way. Thank you. Cheryl Dan West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For weeks, my Liberal colleague, colleagues and I have asked important questions on housing. I've spoken about the lack of access, poor conditions, lack of satisfactory inspections, and more. I've talked about the shortcomings of this government has had on this file and the issues that continue to worsen for Islanders in urban and rural settings. I've also talked at length about our unhoused population and the planning failures that continue to grow, leaving people desperate and unsupported. These are both issues trending in the wrong direction that need better attention from this government. We do have a homeless target strategy that's legislated to meet by January 2025. Question to the Minister of Housing. You tabled, I wouldn't even call it a, a document, I'd call it a piece of paper yesterday that showed a total of 288 people actively experiencing homelessness as of June 15th six, seven line document that appeared to be hastily written. Minister, what is the source of this information? The Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't call it a document that uh, I, I tabled yesterday, Mr. Speaker. I, it, it's some data, it's a report that's produced from the, uh, the HIFAS system. I think we're capable of uh, producing all kinds of data from that database, but it's simply a, a, a by names list, they call it, uh, that's uh, some high level uh, information about uh, the, the clients that they're serving uh, at various community partners um, uh, and it's produced from the uh, HIFAS database that, that's used uh, as part of our coordinated access uh, network and uh, I think it's uh, in insightful data and I provided it to the House uh, at the request of uh, the official opposition and um, uh, happy to um, uh, assist them with a better understanding, with more data, uh, as it's made available. Charlton West Royalty. You said they are serving, Minister. This is your file. This is your responsibility. I don't know who they are, but it's 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 you. You're the housing minister. This isn't high-level data. This is people's lives. 
this is, this is not just seven lines on a piece of paper. And we've got to make sure that it's not, it's not high level at this stage. Um, despite the minister's claim, we know that there are major gaps in the data. Uh, we know that people are falling through the cracks and the issues continue to grow. People are living in tents, sleeping in cars and more. It is important that this data collection is tightened up to allow the, pr the planning by your department. I will use a recent example. Last fall, the government reported that there are 100 people in house. Now you're telling me that there's 288 people. How do you explain a 188 person jump? Are all these people living in transitional housing on the list or have 188 more Islanders found themselves unhoused in the last six months? The Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and the member used a, a recent example and I'll use um, some recent examples as well. Uh, in my, uh, my greetings earlier in the, in the session today, I, I talked about um, uh, my greetings that I gave at, uh, uh, at our workshop this morning with all of our partners that uh, belong to our um, uh, coordinated access system. Uh, they're meeting there today in order to uh, have discussions amongst themselves about how to improve the process of the data we collect, how to improve the services that we deliver based on that data. This is a pro we've made a lot of progress in a very short time on this issue. It's a, it's a process of continuous improvement, working in, in uh, partnership with all of our community partners to, to learn and to improve our services. And, uh, you know, and I, I do understand that the data is not perfect. And I had the opportunity when I spoke with Lisa Cooper of the uh, Native Council this morning to talk about specifically the ing Indigenous data. And there are some reasons why uh, self-reported data is not completely accurate. There are issues of trust in some cases about disclosing personal data. We're trying to overcome those by building that trust and, and learning from what we know. And that's part of that two-day workshop that's happening right now to improve that o service overall, to improve the data so we can improve our response to uh, homelessness overall in this province. Charlton West Royalty. Yeah, and maybe the minister's making my point for me. That's why we need a coordinated access, and it's in your file. And, and we're losing the coordination by uncentralizing that, and we don't have the data. The data has to be centralized in one spot in order for us to get it and do something with it. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's not clear. I need you to spend the summer uh, doing this because I dispute your numbers. I totally dispute your numbers because we've been out there, and we've got to, we can look at Summerside, we can look at downtown Charlottetown, we can look at v various different places places but the outreach from your department is what I want to talk about outreach is, is is outreach being done from your department in communities across PEI to reach unhoused populations to make sure they're identified in the HIFA system not other people I'm asking what you as a minister are doing with your department is that being done minister the Minister of Housing Land and Communities Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and um, we, in fact, do have a centralized system. It's called the uh, Homeless Individuals and Families Information System. And that is the system that is central to our entire network uh, of community partners that manage our coordinated access uh, for the homeless population here in Prince Edward Island. Are we reaching out? I reached out this morning to, the, uh, to all of our partners who are working hard at a workshop as we speak. Uh, and uh, I'm repeating myself here, but this is a process of continuous improvement. That's what's happening at the Murchison Center as I speak right now. Uh, we reach out to all of our partners. This is a, a process of, of learning, of, of developing that set of data. It will continue to improve. It will continue to grow. Uh, and uh, that's something that we'll, uh, as you say, we'll work hard uh, to improve. I will continue to reach out to our partners as I did this morning with the Native Council of PEI. Uh, and uh, I look forward to this being a, a, a years-long process of continuous improvement and better serving this, uh, the homeless population here in PEI. Member for Charlton West Royalty. Well, no, there's no doubt. I, I I believe you will do that. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if it's the right day to do that on National Indigenous People Day to have those discussions. But you need to have those discussions and schedule those meetings um, with all aspects of our community. And and I mean, I don't know because I've asked you questions in this legislature for a very long time, and I'm not even getting the data back. And here's another one. In February, I sent a written question to the previous Minister of Housing regarding the Charlottetown Inn and Conference Center. Last week, I rose again to ask, 
ask questions on the Shawtown Indian Conference Center. I, I don't have a response to date. Uh, it's baffling the minister can't even give me the information about a contract you have with them. I don't know if they have if you have a contract. Um, is this if you do have a contract or if you lost a contract or, or wherever you are, is this transitional housing or emergency shelter? Uh, maybe the minister can enlighten us today. So how many units are being provided at the Charlottetown Inn and Conference Center and does the province have or had a contract and can you table that with the facility? The Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And out of a general consideration of um, respect and privacy for our clients, we prefer not to identify the exact locations where we house them. And um, I would ask that uh, all members of this House respect that, respect the privacy of our, um, our clients in that same way. We, um, we have had contracts in uh, some cases with uh, individual facilities. In this case, we had a contract that the member rightly uh, told the House recently expired, but we have continued uh, to uh, house some clients there for supportive housing on a temporary basis. We're paying, nothing has changed, it's status quo. We're changed from a contract to a day-to-day -day basis. Their key cards were changed uh, so that they could do a daily check-in. Nobody was locked out, everything's status quo. Uh, it, they're there, they're remaining there on a temporary basis while we open a new facility that we've acquired, we've not announced yet. I won't tell you the location, but uh, we'll have some details about that when we're able to move clients into that new facility. Cheryl Tan West Royalty. There, and that's what we're talking about with that. We have to work together. I, 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 I know this. I've worked on this file. I know this file. And, and before I stood up, I didn't, I didn't get confidence that the minister even knew anything about this. So I'm a little bit more optimistic about that, and I appreciate the answer, minister. Um, the, um, let, let move on from housing. Just a couple of questions about uh, housing in my district. Um, construction uh, is approaching completion on the new Tremploy Skill Development Center and the BioCommons, and everyone in our, my community is excited about that, especially for the, the individuals that will be working there and, and training there. Question to the Minister of Housing, does the PEI Housing Corp own the current property on Raiders Road, and what are their plans with this property? The Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, um, the Housing Corporation owns a lot of property. I'm, I'm not um, uh, certain specifically on this and happy to uh, get that answer very quickly for you. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty. I don't know whether to ask another question or say they do own it. Housing Corp owns the property and uh, I mean... Well, I ask because this is not, this is, this is a major important property. Um, I know there's plans for, for this property. I know Housing Corp owns it. I want to make sure that the minister spends the next little while bef so we don't lose time building housing in a housing cr crunch. Um, I, 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 can, I can bring that to you. I can work with you on that. I want to see housing in my, I'm, I'm saying to you, here is housing. Here's a spot for housing. What are we doing? And now I find out Housing Corp doesn't even know if they own it or not. You do own it. And I want to see that developed. I want to see that work with the community. So I'm asking you, Minister, will you find out more information on that. Can we work hand in hand so we can build housing for islanders in desperate need? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I said, the Housing Corporation owns uh, quite a number of properties, uh, some of it vacant land that we intend to build on. We have a work plan. We're working through those projects. We're planning, designing, and actively uh, uh, building new social housing. This property, in fact, would be somewhere on that list in the in the work plan for the future. Uh, but there are more uh, there are more advanced projects that are uh, that are being planned, designed and constructed right now. I'll find out for you exactly where that is in the work plan and uh, I'll get that information for you as soon as possible. The leader of the third party. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. It's been really hard to watch the ferry fiasco in impacting eastern Prince Edward Island and it's shown just how important it is for us to maintain both of our routes on and off PEI. And I, like tens of thousands of islanders, want a really quick resolution and we want to return to normal service as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, in the centre of the island, a different set of concerns persist around the Confederation Bridge, specifically around the tolls. 
The most recent PC platform says that they will, and I quote, establish a working group with the federal government to reduce ferry and bridge tolls to $20, end quote. Now, that's an almost identical promise to the one that was in the 2015 PC platform, but of course, nothing changed during those four years. The federal government stepped in in December to subsidize any potential increases for this year, but at $50.25, we're still a long way from the $20 promised in two straight election platforms. A question to the Deputy Premier. The rising cost of living is making travel off-island quite literally unaffordable for more and more I islanders. When can islanders expect to report from the working group that you said you would set up? And more importantly, real action on this critical issue. The Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the leader of the third party for the question. Um, I was with uh, the Premier when he had a conversation with uh, Dominic LeBlanc of Intergovernmental Affairs on this issue, and uh, I was encouraged with uh, Dominic LeBlanc's response. And uh, he was uh, a, a large component uh, champion for this. Uh, he feels the uh, island deserves this, and islanders deserve this. I feel this is a travesty that uh, first we lose our ferry service uh, and now we're paying some of the highest tolls uh, probably anywhere in the world to get off this island and, uh, and uh, we need to address that and uh, I know the, uh, I'd have to get more details on the working group uh, from the Premier but uh, I know he is very passionate about this and would love to see this happen. Uh, sooner than later. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party. Thank you. I agree. Islanders do deserve this. And one islander in particular I met with earlier this week. Her name is Olivia McDougall. And she's a grade 10 student at Bluefield High School. And she started a civics project in her class with her teacher, Amy McPherson, on the bridge tolls, which has exploded into a petition with now over 15,000 signatures on it, which I'll be tabling in the House later today. I have to tell this House that it was, it was one of the most inspiring meetings that I've had in a long time. Olivia was informed, she was passionate, she was, she was fiercely focused on fixing this problem that she saw affecting so many islanders. To the Minister of Finance, Olivia feels that a reduction of $20, to $20 for island residents is entirely possible if the political will exists to achieve that. She suggested two ways that we could accomplish this. Firstly, lobbying to increase the federal subsidy or renegotiating the terms of the contract with SCI and the federal government. What mechanism does this government prefer to reduce bridge tolls for islanders? The Minister of Finance. I think this, I, I, I wouldn't be able to stand here and speak today about the mechanisms that we could use. What I can say today is um, I would love to sit down with Olivia myself and bring her into the process, which, which would be kind of interesting, and have her come in. And uh, we can kind of have a conversation on that together. Um, I think that would be interesting. Um, and, but aside from that, um, that's certainly something that we can look into. I know the Premier has this as a priority, so maybe the work has already been done um, um, to research that and, and see what we can do for Islanders in that space. Thanks. Leader of the third party. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, response and the offer, and, and I'm sure that Olivia would be happy, and you'd be better off for it. She's an astonishing young woman. She also talked about the unfairness of people who have to travel off-island for medical care. The PC platform also talks about launching a medical transportation assistance program to provide islanders who have to travel out of province, and there are many of them, for medical treatment, with help covering the costs for meals, for gas, for bridge, for all of those signs of, uh, of expenses, including ferry tolls when the ferries are running. To the Minister of Health and Wellness, Hope Air already exists, but it only covers some of those costs and it excludes thousands and thousands of islanders. How do islanders apply for this new and what sounds like a great program, and is it up and running yet? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm not familiar with the mechanisms to, to actually apply to Hope Air. I'm definitely um, uh, familiar with the program. But again, I think as we said during the budget debate, we do have an RFP out. I think it closes in the next few days to uh, look at a, a medical travel reimbursement program. I think the, if uh, I read the RFP, uh, just a quick scan of it, and that the results are due in late September. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we come up with a, a plan that's 
fair and equitable and help support people when they go for off-file uh, medical services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the minister responsible for the status of women stated, and I quote, I know our department was heavily involved in the formation of the NDA Act, end quote. This is not how I remembered it, and it didn't quite sit well with me, so our office looked through our meeting log and notes and found that the minister and her department had one consultation meeting with her office, provided no letter of support, no amendments, and asked no questions when the bill came to the floor. The only reasons we have made any progress in this province regarding NDAs is because of the tireless work of the Green Caucus and incredible public journalism. Question to the minister responsible for the status of women. Will you correct the statement you made yesterday to reflect the very little involvement you and your department actually had in the creation of the NDA bill? The Minister of Education, Early Years, and the Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, um, for the question. Certainly in my role as Minister Responsible for the Status of Women, we work across departments, so we are an advocate for women's issues, and um, this is an area that <coughs> certainly we were uh, advocating for. The main player, uh, main department that would have been involved was justice. So I know the director of the Interministerial Women's Secretary would have had constant and continuous communication with the uh, individuals within that department. So perhaps we weren't necessarily at all the tables. I know those conversations were ongoing. I was constantly being informed on um, the latest uh, discussions and again I was really happy that as a house we supported the bill unanimously and I think it's uh, again really appreciate the work of the Green Party in uh, bringing this forward. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you Mr. Speaker. That's not what was claimed yesterday and I, I do appreciate that. Um, yesterday, the Minister of Justice told media that he was looking into ways to help the two women with NDAs at UPEI to speak to the investigators of the report. Unfortunately, I have a reason to believe that the Minister is not going to do much about this. On November 22, 2022, seven months ago, Lynn Lund, then MLA for Summerside Wilmot, asked the following question, and I will ask it once again. I quote, when I drafted legislation of the NDA Act, I included a section that spells out a list of exemptions that are true, even for old NDAs. And the last one on that list is a person or class of persons as prescribed in the regulations. Actually, you have the power to change it so that workplace investigators investigations are exempt and these voices are free to be heard and these people can be empowered, like UPEI is saying they want in the first place. Will you immediately add workplace investigations as a class of persons that people are free to talk to about their NDAs, or will you side with their abusers? Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park for the question. And uh, I have staff looking into what we can do within re regulations right now to help uh, these victims and uh, ensure that. And so that work is underway, and uh, hopefully we can uh, support these victims at this time. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I would have loved to hear a yes there, Minister. It's p pretty clear that the public loses and abusers win when abusers are allowed to silence their victims. And as we heard in the case of these women, paraphrased, the men told me they had it covered, so as a woman I stayed silent. That is just, what, just too reflective of our society. Without this change, these women and their UPEI community will see no justice. To the Justice Minister, is there any benefit other than that to the abuser himself in preventing people who have signed NDAs from talking about what they experienced during an investigation on workplace harassment? The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, uh, uh, fully acknowledge the, the situation that these uh, victims are under and uh, uh, the, the f fact that they uh, are at the will of their abusers on this. And uh, it's important that uh, we uh, address this. And I've, again, I've asked our department to do everything we can to help uh, this, in this situation to uh, advance this. We're exploring all options in the NDA Act. Uh, we're exploring anything that we can do and in regulation at this time to help these victims. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The member for Cheryl. The member for Bourne Concora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The federal government is worried about how much fuel Islanders are using and are bringing their new carbon tax measures into place. However, they are not concerned over us having no ferry service. My honourable colleague yesterday from Surya Myra and today raised important concerns about the closure of the Wood Islands ferry service and the impacts. Today, I'd like to add some additional concerns for consideration from the area I represent, Borden Kinkora. Question to the Deputy Premier. What contingency plans are being looked at by government for the surge in vehicle traffic on the Confederation Bridge that will come from the closure of the Wood Islands Ferry Service for the next month? The Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, this is, I have to be honest, one of the situations that I didn't, uh, we, we haven't talked about yet, uh, Mr. Speaker, the impact on the member from Borden Concord's district. And uh, that's, it's, like I said earlier in my uh, question period, it is a travesty that we're in this situation. There's no reason why we don't have two ferries in, uh, in Wood Islands right now. Uh, there's no reason we, we're in this situation other than uh, we haven't. We have been ignored, and it's time that uh, that stops. And I look forward to working with the premier to address the situation that we're in. And I will look forward to uh, a plan for Borden Carleton in the situation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Borden Kincora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Schools are winding down for the year, and families are starting their travel plans for the summer. The busy Canada weekend is coming up, followed by the Cabinet's Beast Music Festival and other festivals across this whole island. The bridge will be more congested with no ferry service for a month. This will have a huge impact right across our province, affecting travelers, affecting tourists, primary producers, and also small businesses. Question to the Deputy Premier. Long delays on the bridge will have huge impacts right across Prince Edward Island. Has government had talks with the bridge operator about their concerns and how they are going to deal with it? The Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this member is always two steps ahead of us. <laughs> always two steps ahead. Uh, we, we, we have had conversations with Northumberland Ferries. Uh, and if you listen, Mr. Speaker, you hear that? That's crickets. We haven't heard anything, anything from the federal government. The member uh, from uh, Cardigan, we haven't heard anything from them. Uh, we were disappointed. And to the member across, we have to address the situation. I, I mean, I wish I owned a gas station in that area this summer because it's going to be busy. Thank you. <laughs> the member for Orton King Cora. Well, I'll be honest with you, given what the federal government is bringing forward, I wouldn't want to have a gas station today. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is totally unacceptable. We've been waiting for a second ferry or a new ferry for over 25 years in this province. This should be a major priority for all four island MPs and the federal government. But it's not. On the other hand, we have the federal government asleep at the switch on our key transportation links. On the other hand, we have the federal government posed to drive up fuel prices of their new carbon taxes and the clean fuel standards. Question to the Deputy Premier. Shouldn't ensuring our transportation links are properly maintained be a higher priority by the federal government than jacking up prices at the pumps and islanders having limited mainland access. Deputy Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the only one, only people that are, are losing here, Mr. Speaker, are islanders. We are paying the price here, Mr. Speaker. And uh, now is the time. Uh, I know the, the Premier's uh, uh, drafting the letter to the Prime Minister uh, as we speak, uh, he was doing that this morning, to address this. Maybe it's this is the time that we'll push, as the questions earlier on the $20 toll, maybe it's, this is the time that we treat Islanders with respect and we uh, do the right thing and uh, to make life just a little more affordable for us here on the Prince Arnau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Member for Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The need for medical services to treat cataracts is growing and I often hear from Islanders concerned about the delays in the accessing service. 
Question to the Minister of Health. What do the current wait times for cataract treatments look like? Get last. Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Honourable Member. That question. I have, we have received a lot of inquiries in our office about wait times. We recognize how important um, that it is. Um, we're talking a lot about the federal government these day, uh, today. So um, on that CHT funding, um, one of the priority areas is health workers and backlogs. So again, um, good on the federal government. I'll give them a little kudos to uh, help us on backlogs. So we understand it's a problem and we need to work towards uh, reducing those wait times. Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I do hear the wait times are still growing. The national benchmark for cataract surgeries is 112 days, but only 30% of islanders get the service within the time frame. So the question to the Minister of Health, what is the cause of these backlogs and delays? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. We, we do recognize that we have uh, increased some staff um, to perform these uh, procedures. Uh, we're doing an extra two per day. Obviously, that is, is more than what we need. And we also identified the need for another ophthalmologist, um, and we're in the process of trying to recruit that third, opto third or fourth opt ophthalmologist, I can't even say the word, uh, to, our, to our staff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Early treatments of cataracts, or at least one, at least one eye, reduces the rates of motor vehicle accident, accidents by 53%. The longer you wait, the more complications that can occur, and it's important that something gets done to address the situation. And you might have already answered it, uh, Minister, but question to the Minister of Health, what steps are being taken to clean up this situation? Hmm. Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I did forget to mention that, actually, I, I did forget this, that we actually have a meeting with uh, those ophthalmologists in July to discuss some, some options on how to move this forward. Because you understand that these types of procedures need to be done sooner than later. So it, it's recognized by the department. And again, we had that meeting in July with that group to see uh, what other solutions we can provide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. O'Leary and Burness. Mr. Speaker, I recently asked the Minister of Social Development Seniors about our child protection services in West Prince. I have since learned that O'Leary has four permanent positions in Lennox Island too. All of them are now based out of Summerside. Some of these staff used to work out of the Access PEI in O'Leary where they were close to a significant caseload they currently carry. In Prince County alone last year, there was 343 child protection investigations. What is even more perplexing is that the fact that the travel budget for child protection has been cut. A relocation of West Prince has less money to travel out of the province. This doesn't add up, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister. Why have these staff been sent to Summerside where they are required to travel and have less budget to do so? Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for that question. And social workers are difficult to find, and, and we are working them out of Somerside, as I said in the, in the budget debate the other night. We're working them out of Somerside and O'Leary and Charlottetown. People are moving around um, to, to accommodate the, the clients uh, to, the best of, to the best of our ability. They are hard to find, and I just want to um, just say thank you to every social worker out there. They're working very hard. Thank you. Member for Willary Inverness. We should be apologizing to the children of West Prince on this. This week we saw the importance of investing in child protection services. An Amber Alert was issued because of a child abduction. It's imperative that we invest in the services that have staff to get ahead of these issues before the result in worse situations. Question to the Minister. How many families will this relocation of staff impact and uh, what further area has a decrease in the travel budget while fuel costs in my opinion, they're going to increase. If you believe the member from Borden King Cora, they're going to go up. The children of West Prince deserve better. Your inability to hire staff is not a good enough uh, answer here, uh, Madam Spe or Mr. Speaker. So how many families will be impacted by this move? The Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. And the hope is that no family is impacted by this move. Um, we'll do whatever we have to do. If we have to move people around from uh, uh, town to town, city to city, we're going to do that to ensure that the children are looked after. And you have that 340 million child protection investigations because I gave you that information the other night, and I'm free to give you any information that you need. And you're coming to, I think, a meeting with me on uh, very soon in July to your office in O'Leary. Um, we're working as hard as we can. Thank you. 
The member for Willary and Vernis, your final question. How many people out of West Prince were impacted in this? But anyway, you gave me Prince County. Uh, the government continues to take jobs out of Volary and ship them to other municipalities. First, we saw Skills PEI, that's costing taxpayers 300000 and now Child Protection Services. How much will this extra cost uh, move cost island taxpayers, and when will these staff be returned to access PEI in Volary? The Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. We don't want to take any staff out of anywhere, and I know that you know that. We are trying to service the children of Prince Edward Island to the best of our abilities, and hopefully no child suffers, and that's the plan. Thank you very much. End of question period. Um, statements by ministers. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to announce a new five-year anti-racism action plan for Prince Edward Island. The government of PEI wants to reaffirm our commitment to anti-racism, as well as our support for racialized and indigenous communities. The Anti-Racism Action Plan highlights the role we have to play and provides concrete measures to address, address racism. Mr. Speaker, the goal of this action plan are to improve social, economic, educational, and health, health outcomes for racialized and indigenous people living in our province and to ensure that policies, legislation, programs, and actions by government are informed and evidence-based. We want to promote an inclusive environment where BIPOC communities, organizations, and groups can thrive. This plan will aim to provide concrete actions, increase diversity within their public service, and mitigate the experience of racism that leads to more inclusive island. Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure the vision was created by the BIPOC community who have been historically affected. It was vital to have input from people with lived experience. During the engagement process, three key, three key pillars were identified. These include inclusive cu culture and communities, BIPOC representation and advancement, legislation, leadership, program, and policy review. Mr. Speaker, a new anti-racism office headed by manager of anti-racism initiatives will oversee the implementation of this plan. This office will use a collaborative approach to address systemic racism, promote diversity, and achieve anti-racist results. We all have a role to play in ending racism and discrimination in our society. To do that, we must engage in difficult conversations to ensure that everyone is aware that racism of any kind is unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to stand today and table government's anti-racism action plan. Thank you very much. Charlton West Royalty. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Minister, for, um, um, for this incredibly important announcement. And, a five-year action plan is exactly what we need, and I will guarantee that during my time here, I will be here holding you to account to the to the to the issues and to, to this issue in particular. And I, I think I have that. An Islander once said, "The difference between love and hate is indifference," and that was said by E.B. here in in town. Um, he lives in Charlottetown, and you think about that: the difference between love and hate is indifference. We cannot be indifferent anymore. And we have to love, and there was a lot of love put into this document. There was a lot of love by the table put into this document to make sure that we don't become indifferent as a society. And this takes a lot of hard work. It takes hard work from everybody because you look at words like microaggressions. It is a word to you. It means a whole lot else to other people. And we need to stay together, follow this plan, and do much more than this. There is huge issues when our chief public health officer says that racism is a public health emergency. It transcends government. 
It transcends all the little things. It's difficult for people, if you are, are of color or you're black or you're indigenous, to go to work in a space. It is much more than just an action plan. This is a sense that we can be better as a province. We can include more. Inclusion is where we're going. There's a large process in between that. Equity is mentioned an awful lot. Equity is putting people ahead, making sure that they have the opportunities where opportunities were not there for people like my father, for people like our fathers. We are in the space and we must make sure that we take this very seriously, both as we do the action plan and as we be accountable for the action plan. I want to give government a compliment. We were slow out of the gate on this, and I think we have a lot of work to do in, in Prince Edward Island, but I see government starting to listen to this, and we must continue to work together, and I look forward to working together. This is a very proud day for me, and it should be a very proud day for everybody who's done this work on this file. We, we, we salute you, and we will respect this document and do whatever we can, because uh, the difference between love and hate is indifference. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the statement. Uh, I'd like to start off by acknowledging the tremendous work that Charlottetown West Royalty has done on this and many other issues, but specifically and particularly this issue since he has been elected to this, uh, this legislature. And I think it's a really good example of the importance of representation. And the voice he has provided in this House, which has not been heard before, has rung throughout this room and throughout our province. And it has been the catalyst which has brought forward initiatives such as this. So thank you so much, Charlottetown and West Royalty, for the work you're doing. This is a very, very important statement. And uh, we've been waiting with great anticipation for this. And I'm very, very, speaking personally, very, very happy that it is here. Because we sit at a, a very precarious moment. I think there have, no doubt, been improvements. Uh, but we, but as always, uh, you don't have to look very far to see examples where racism still exists in Prince Edward Island and across Canada. And there is much, much work to do. And a lot of that work lies with people who are not part of the BIPOC community but can be better allies. And it is incumbent on each and every one of us, regardless of our heritage, to be a part of this solution because racism is not going to be resolved by the BIPOC community alone, because it's not a BIPOC problem. It is a societal problem. It's a societal issue, and it's going to take every single one of us to contribute to resolving this. I, again, want to acknowledge and thank Charlottetown West Royalty for the work. Thank you, Minister, for this five-year anti-racism action plan, for delivering it today. And the delivery of the plan is important, but far, far, far more important is that we act on this and we deliver in a way to make this province a better and a safer place for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport. Not doing well. Okay. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, if I leave the House, I beg to leave to table an anti racism action plan 2023 to 2028 and the anti racism table annual report for 2023. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table uh, a screenshot of the online petition that I referred to in my questions today, created by Olivia McDougall, which now has over 15,000 signatures asking for the bridge toll on the Confederation Bridge to be reduced to $20 for Islanders. 
And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Victoria Park, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry? Reports by committees. The member for Charlottetown Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as a member of and on behalf of the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly Management and yourself as chair, I beg leave to introduce a report of the committee regarding Bill 104, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act, and I move, seconded by the honourable member from Tignish Palmer Road, that the same now be received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I now also seek unanimous consent to waive Rule 110, Section 5 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly regarding notice on the adoption of a committee report. Honourable Members, does the member have unanimous consent to move for the adoption of the report? Yes. yes. Member, you have unanimous consent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While this bill does have implications on the operations of the Legislative Assembly, the committee recognizes uh, that should the House decide to pass this bill, the committee will determine how to exercise its powers and duties as outlined in the rules of the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Assembly Act. And I move, seconded by the member from Cornwall Meadowbanks, that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Introduction of government bills. Motions other than government. Orders other than government. The member for Charlottetown, West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This time I'll call motion 46 to be read. Motion 46. The Leader of the Opposition moves, seconded by the member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas gambling addiction is a serious and growing problem that can have a devastating impact on individuals, families, and communities. And whereas studies have shown that exposure to gambling at a young age can increase the risk of developing a gambling addiction later in life. And whereas schools have an important role to play in educating and informing their students about the risks associated with gambling and ways to prevent gambling addiction. And whereas many school curriculums do not include adequate education on the risks associated with gambling. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urges government of Prince Edward Island to take action to increase gambling addiction awareness for school-aged children through educational programs, resources, and services, and creating policies to support this effort. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urges government of Prince Edward Island to explore initiatives to increase awareness about the negative impacts of gambling addiction, including, but not limited, to community outreach programs, public service announcements, and other awareness campaigns. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urges the government of Prince Edward Island to work with stakeholders, including educators, parents, community organizations, and mental health experts to develop a comprehensive plan to increase gambling addiction awareness for school-aged children. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I rise today to move this motion urging government to, uh, on the government uh, to increase gambling addiction awareness for school-aged children. As we know, gambling addiction is a serious issue that can have devastating consequences for individuals, families, and communities. Unfortunately, many young people today are exposed to gambling through various forms of media, and it's crucial that we equip them with the knowledge and the resources that they need to make informed decisions and avoid the onset of addiction. By raising awareness about the risks of gambling and addiction at a young age, it can help to reduce the stigma associated with seeking help and encourage individuals struggling with this issue to access treatment and support. This can have far-reaching social benefits as individuals struggling, struggling with addiction often experience a range of negative impacts including financial difficulties, deterioration in relationships, and mental health challenges. I believe that the government has an important role to play in addressing gambling addiction, particularly by supporting education and outreach initiatives that target school-aged children. By partnering with uh, educators and other stakeholders, 
government can develop age-appropriate resources and interventions that speak to the unique needs and experiences of young people today. When it comes to gambling related uh, to children and youth, what I'm hearing about the most are concerns related to sports betting advertisements. While sports betting has always been a thing, a sheer volume of online gambling advertisement, advertisements being fed to viewers who are watching, let's say Hockey Night in Canada, has increased significantly, Mr. Speaker. So I spoke to a parent recently, recently who said uh, she used to have uh, parental protections on a tablet and censoring what her child was watching online. Uh, but of course now she feels it's hard to sit and watch a, a hockey game with her child because you are bombarded with betting ads. And these ads are clearly appealing to young children, which is where my concern lies. They're flashy and, and sometimes have influences like NHL stars in them. And to be frank about this matter, when you're watching hockey these days, sports betting ads have become, a common, uh, has become as common as commercials for trucks. So, Mr. Speaker, government has a duty to protect our children and to protect our youth from the harms of online gambling. Increasing awareness about the seriousness of gambling, including the sports betting, in their, educa in their education system is a great place to start. Today I had questions regarding educational material that uh, would be uh, taught in our schools um, regarding gambling addictions, and I'm hoping that there is something more in place than just general addictions, uh, Mr. Speaker. It, excuse me, and if there isn't, then, then this is a start that the schools, obviously, this motion is put forward for that, um, get um, working on that um, immediately because it, 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 it's causing a huge problem for many families uh, and communities here on Prince Edward Island. As a society, we have a collective responsibility uh, to protect our, chim our, our children from harm harmful uh, in influences, um, including those that may come from uh, sports betting ads. So I asked many questions uh, this morning um, regarding uh, data on Islanders which, uh, with gambling addictions, um, requesting numbers on how much Islanders are, are spending online and uh, how much Islanders are spending at VLTs, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I asked for details on tracking, uh, on how many use casino um, facilities and also uh, VLT um, gambling. So I'm hoping that uh, those numbers will come back. The minister says she'll bring them back. Um, we'd love to see them back because uh, we have to know what those numbers are. The, this issue needs to be, first of all, acknowledged. And I'm sure those numbers will back up everything that I've been saying, Mr. Speaker. So uh, starting to help and to educate um, our children at a young age is very, very important. Um, we need to do all that we can to, um, I, I guess, prevent them from being explo uh, exposed and influenced by these uh, ads, um, whether you see them on social media or on television, uh, Mr. Speaker. So in conclusion, I hope that every member in this House today uh, will support this motion uh, and to prioritize efforts to increase uh, gambling addiction awareness among school-aged children here on Prince Edward Island. Um, and by doing so, we can help to prevent the onset of uh, addiction and support those individuals and those communities in achieving better health and well-being outcomes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. The uh, member for Charlottetown Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, and it is a pleasure to rise and uh, just to uh, say th thank the Honourable Member for bringing this motion forward, uh, and I, I do support this. Um, it's funny, some of the, uh, the specific things that the Honourable Member talked about in his remarks are some of the exact same things that I would see. I have two small young children who absolutely love hockey. They absolutely love the NHL playoffs. And, my daughter, who is a keen, uh, a keen uh, grade six uh, student, and that was her question to me was, Daddy, I, I don't know why there are so many questions or so many commercials that are promoting gambling. And, and it's, they're doing game breaks and 
And you, the honorable member is very correct in, in his remarks, um, saying that you know it, it is the youth that, that, that educate. And I think we kind of go back to, it's funny now. Um, I've realized, Mr. Speaker, that I'm getting to that stage in my life where I have a technical question. I used to be able to solve them myself. And a lot of times now I'm going to my daughter to say, how do I do this uh, on this app, on this phone, or blah, blah, blah. So I, I completely agree with the honorable member. I do want to thank him for bringing it forward. I last, uh, the last session that we were in this legislature, I brought a forward a motion as well that asked government to update its responsible, responsible gaming strategy. And uh, I, I do hope that, uh, I know that in the question period there today, the Minister of Health had mentioned that the update is coming at some point in time, and I hope that does come uh, fairly quick because I think we all know uh, some of the damages that can be done with, uh, with gambling. Um, it, it can ruin people's lives, and, and it can ruin, more importantly, not the person who becomes addicted to gambling, but it can also, more importantly, impact the people closest to that person. So, Mr. Speaker, I will conclude my remarks, but I do want to thank the Honourable Member for bringing it forward, and I will be supporting your motion. Minister of uh, Education and Early Years. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for bringing the motion forward and for the questions uh, today. And certainly, as I had said, it's, um, it's an area that is important, you know, as, as a mom, to, as a mom and as minister, it's, it's incredibly important and increasingly more so. So I'm glad we have the opportunity here to discuss this today. And um, just before starting, I am absolutely in support of the motion. So uh, I do want to acknowledge that gambling in various forms has become increasingly accessible. Online platforms and technological advancements have brought gambling opportunities right into the hands of individuals of all ages, including our youth. According to Stats Canada's report on who gambles and who experiences gambling problems here in Canada, youth, including those up to the age of 24, were the least likely to gamble. However, we do know that from sports betting to online casinos, the allure of quick riches can easily captivate impressionable minds. Therefore, it's our duty as responsible adults and leaders to equip our youth with the necessary knowledge to navigate those temptations. And I agree that education is absolutely the key to empowering our young people to make informed choices. By educating them about the risks of gambling, we arm them with the tools to recognize the potential pitfalls and negative consequences. As I had stated in, uh, in question period, our department has developed, piloted and implemented a new physical and health education curriculum for our grades 7 to 9 students. This research is evidence-based curriculum, moves away from content-based learning and focuses on skills-based learning, following the guideline proposed by the World Health Organization. This framework emphasizes coping and self-management skills, decision-making and critical thinking skills, as well as communication and interpersonal skills. The Wellness uh, 10 course, which is mandatory graduation requirement, helps our students develop healthy decision-making and refusal skills and explores the broad determinants of well-being. Through health curriculum outcomes, we continue to teach students about the harmful effects of substance use, addictions, and how to develop healthy personal decision making and refusal skills. Our education team is also working with other government and community partners to help educate adult influencers of students, including teachers, student services, student well-being teams, health PEI, and parents about addictive substances such as drugs alcohol, tobacco, and gambling. Sometimes individuals, particularly young people, can see gambling as a quick way to make some money. They need to comprehend that gambling is not a reliable path to wealth, but rather a game of chance where the odds are often stacked against the players. Through our CEO course, which is also a mandatory grad requirement, we emphasize the importance of financial planning and responsible budgeting and in turn empowering our, our young people to make wise choices with their hard-earned money. Furthermore, educating our youth about the potential social and emotional consequences of gambling is, is essential. Social-emotional learning has been a foundational piece of our school year this year, and, uh, and this will continue until the 2023-2024 school year. 
We all know that gambling addiction can lead to strained relationships, financial hardships, mental health issues, and academic decline. We've all probably in this house known somebody who unfortunately has, um, has had a gambling addiction. Um, the Department of Health and Wellness has been working to bring gambling to the forefront for island students, and I do want to thank uh, them for their collaboration on this. A new section has been added to the provincial gambling websites, a website with resources and information specifically curated for youth, parents, and educators. Topics including what is underage gambling, youth gambling, taking makes talking makes a difference, uh, video games from gaming to gambling, underage gambling in picks. We have organizations such as STEAM PEI and local enforcement agencies who come into our schools to speak to students about cyber safety and making good choices online. Health and wellness have gambling awareness presentations happening across the province, particularly with higher risk communities, including REACH, the Strength Program, and our Indigenous youth. This summer, health staff will be taking their gambling awareness presentation to the Youth Justice Camp. Their topics will include ga gaming versus gambling, chance versus skill, probability versus randomness, healthy choices for wellness, and mental health. By highlighting real life stories and providing them with resources for help uh, and support, we are helping our youth to recognize warning signs and seek help if needed. Creating a culture of open dialogue and encouraging discussions around gambling related issues can go a long way in destigmatizing the topic and ensuring that our youth know that they are not alone in this. It is my understanding that health staff will be working with our educational team and the school authorities to bring some of their resources into our classrooms to support our students and our teachers. Madam, Mr. Speaker, the importance of educating our youth about the risks of gambling can certainly not be overstated. By equipping them with the necessary knowledge and skills, we empower them to make responsible choices and navigate the complex world of gambling with caution and understanding. We all have a role to play in this, so let us work together as parents, educators, and community members. By investing in their education, we invest in a brighter future for our society as a whole, and I look forward to continuing to work with the Department of Health to further the supports we have in our schools for island students and families. Again, Mr. Speaker, I'll absolutely be um, supporting this motion. I think, again, I'm, I'm glad this was brought to the House. It's an area that I can um, certainly delve into and be a stronger advocate for. So I uh, do appreciate it, and I look, I, I'm, I'm happy to meet too with the opposition members if, if they so choose and um, discuss ways and opportunities that we can uh, further this work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for those uh, you know, encouraging um, um, issues that we're, we're dealing with and the ways that we're, we're talking about gambling here. And, and you pr presented some, some things that are being done. Um, but we are falling, we're falling behind because we're dealing with something that we don't understand and know. Like, when I was, I think I was in grade seven, my parents took me to Florida. We were down in Florida for a year. My dad was on sabbatical, and it was interesting because a new new system, new school, inner city Tampa, and the, when I when I got there, I was wondering why everybody was had all had all these pencils. Everybody had all these pencils, right? Different colored pencils and different things. Anyway, there was a game that people were gambling with the pencils in grade seven. Yeah, they were. That's how they collected. That's how they they just they did something. It was it was a it was a gambling scheme that everybody got into, and that was a, that they could collect different pencils and everything. It was just weird, and I was into a different society. I didn't understand it. Um, but that was on the ground, and, and you could participate or not, but that was when you were in grade seven. And some of the people there took this very, very, very seriously. But my point is that when you learn these things at an early age, when I, when I wasn't part of that culture or that community, and I learned it then, before two or three weeks, I was involved in it. And I was like, how do I, how do, I do what they're doing? And that's where we are with gambling. Because at an early age, back then I had to deal with pencils. Now you have to deal with the ability to get on a website, to get on something, and you can start off with playing with no money. You can start off with, with doing whatever. You can learn the behaviors. Um, and 
that's an isolated thing. Technology is right in front of us, whether it's an iPad, a computer, uh, a telephone, uh, whatever you can. So it's, it's at the access and the finger, and it's, and it's very quiet um, where people get addicted at an early age. And I think that's why, just like the cyberbullying strategy that, that the province will come up with, we have to really think about this in terms of education and, and making sure that, that this does not, this does not um, hurt people in the future. At a younger age, um, back in the day, v VLT lottos were in different convenience stores and different things. Now it's on your phones. Now, it's, now you can get to it at a much quicker access. So this motion is, is, again, building awareness and looking at it at an early age to talk about uh, the repercussions of not not having this under control, and and I, I thank the minister for for uh, for talking about those things, and thank the department for looking at this. And I think this motion can only strengthen that because we're concerned. We're concerned about um, about big companies, uh, even in Atlantic current profits, um, disguised profits. I don't want those in the hands of children. I don't want people to get to grow up and, and to be addicted to something and understand and learn something. And that is where the sporting world's going. That is where a bunch of different other worlds are going. So we have to make sure we stay vi vigilant and, um, and work together as the legislature and do what we can to make sure that, that Islanders stay safe and, and they learn the repercussions of gambling at an early age. I'd like to thank the speaker for this time. Thank you, Honorable Member. The member for Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just wanted to thank the member for bringing this forward. Uh, it's a great motion, like some of my colleagues across the way mentioned when they talk about their kids watching sports. I got a daughter who plays hockey and loves to watch hockey with me, and she's the same way. She sees these superstars promoting different things, and I just, I hear exactly what they're saying because I go to my daughter for technical advice when it comes to the phone and whatnot. I, I'm just mesmerized by how quick these children this day and age can pick up technology and go. The other day I was driving down the road and a text come through and I said, Livia, pick up that phone, open it up, I need you to respond. And she's talking to me and the fingers are going and she's like this and I'm like, well, what are you... And she put a whole paragraph in there without looking at it on this little screen and never had a word wrong, a letter wrong, or nothing. It's just unbelievable how quick our kids are picking up on technology. So I look back when I was a, a young kid and I was running around the SRW trying to bet tickets on horse racing when I was 16 and you had to be 18. And that was the biggest hurdle for me was to find someone to get my tickets or sweet talk one teller that had let me buy the tickets without my father coming out and seeing. And that, that was the problem I dealt with. But now it's right in their hands. So I just want to thank the honorable member for bringing this motion forward. Are there any other members who wish to speak to the motion? If not, I'll go back to the move for the motion. The leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank all of those who uh, who uh, stood up today and, and spoke on it. Uh, in particular, the uh, minister responsible for education in early years. Uh, for what they're doing right now and, and that they are committed to, to working on it. Um, much work needs to be done, so I'm, I'm glad to see that's a, that's a step forward. Um, I'm glad to see that she is also committed to supporting this motion along with the other members who stood to speak, because um, we have to do everything we can to protect um, our most vulnerable, and that, that is our children, um, Mr. Speaker. So basically, um, this was a, uh, asking the government to take action to increase the gambling addiction awareness for school aged children through educational programs, uh, resources and services and creating policies to support this effort. It's asking government to explore initiatives to increase awareness about negative impacts of gambling addiction, including but not limited to um, community outreach programs, public service announcements and other awareness campaigns, and also urges government to work with stakeholders and including educators, parents, community organizations, mental health experts, to develop a comprehensive plan to increase gambling addiction awareness for school-aged children. So I ask, uh, again, uh, that uh, this go to a, a vote, Mr. Speaker, and that I'm hoping to have a unanimous support on this. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. All those voting in favor of the motion, please say yay. Yay. All those voting against the motion, please say nay. 
Honourable Member, your motion has passed unanimously. Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you. I'll call motion 35. Mr. Speaker, motion 35, universal mental health care, is currently under debate. Debate was adjourned by the leader of the third party. I'll ask the leader of the third party to continue debate. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to do so, and I spoke uh, for, I'm not sure how long, a few minutes last time this uh, motion was on the floor. I was delighted to stand up and support it, and uh, really feel like I said everything I wanted to contribute to the debate last time, and I look forward to others speaking to this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there any other members wishing to speak to the motion? All right, I'll go back to the mover of the motion, the member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, and, and this motion again was on uh, universal mental health. So we were talking about how we need to work towards that. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very prominent where we have a motion, we're talking about some things. Mental health is, is uh, I was just chatting with somebody this morning very briefly, and uh, a student at, 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 at a university, and, and they said that mental health is, they struggle with mental health and they want access. You're making strides on this, but is it universal for everybody? So we did some work today on an action plan and an anti-racism action plan and, and table. This is a major concern where we, we need for the marginalized communities um, that they need universal mental health care so they have access. And that becomes a struggle because we don't have, we don't have professionals in these fields that that are from that community. So it's, it's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of hard work. It's not just for us saying yes, we have to strive for this. We have to make sure if somebody has mental health concerns, they can access it quickly. There's been a lot of changes in this file across the province, some that uh, are very good and a lot of people that are working hard, but some that we're having strugg struggles with staffing, having access. I do not want to see access as a barrier to people dealing and struggling with their mental health. So this motion does that and sets and says that we, we need to get on uh, track to, to do that too. So at this time, I'd like to uh, call for the vote, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member. Uh, so we are voting on uh, motion 35. All those voting in favor of the motion, please say yay. 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 All those voting against the motion, please say nay. Honourable Member, your motion has passed unanimously. The Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you. At this time, I'll call motion three. Mr. Speaker, motion three, addressing the rising cost of living in our province is currently under debate and debate was adjourned by the Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. The Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I have spoken on that and I adjourn. Thank you very much. Members, I've exhausted my list. Does, does anybody else wish to speak to this motion? If not, I'll go to the mover of the motion to close debate, the Honourable Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and just, just uh, the recap again, this was about the rising cost of living and it's something that we faced for, for a very long time in Prince Edward Island. Um, even though uh, inflation might be cooling a little bit, it still remains high in Prince Edward Island. And, and, uh, and I w at this time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, send this motion to a vote. You're hustling, Honourable Member. Um, Honourable Members, uh, this is, uh, we are voting on motion number three. All those voting in favour of the motion, please say yay. Yay. All those voting against the motion, please say nay. Honourable Member, your motion has passed. The Member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call Bill 104 now be read a second time.
Order number 19, an act to amend the, uh, pardon me. Order number 20, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act, Bill number 104, ordered for second reading. Member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park. I move seconded by the Honourable Leader for the third party that the bill be read a second time. Shall I carry? Carry. Bill number 104, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act, read a second time. I'll ask the uh, member for Charlottetown Windsor to chair committee of the whole. Oh, my apologies. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Seconded by the leader of the third party that this house resolve itself in the committee of the whole set, the whole house to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Carry. Sorry, honourable member, I got ahead of myself. Now I'll ask the member for Charlottetown Winslow to chair committee of the whole. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled uh, Bill Number 104, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act. Promoter, um, I believe you have a stranger. Yes. Would you like permission to uh, bring the stranger on the floor? Yes. Uh, shall the uh, promoter have, uh, have permission? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cut her out. Thank you. Right? <laughs> Should, I should have put forward a motion to ask. That's the problem. Um, good afternoon, stranger. I'll get you to say your name and your title for Hanser, please. Sure. I'm Nate Hood, Senior Policy Advisor to the Third Party. Uh, beautiful. Um, before we get into the bill, I might ask the promoter if you have a few opening remarks. Yes, I do. Thank you. So uh, I'm pleased to sponsor Bill 104, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act. And this bill would expand the jurisdiction of the Ombudsperson to include publicly funded post-secondary institutions, which include UPEI, Hall and College, and Collège de Lille. Bringing post-secondary institutions under the Ombudsperson Act should not be viewed as a punitive measure. It isn't. In fact, we believe this is a positive change that will help rebuild trust in our post-secondary sector at a time when many islanders have questions about the culture at our post-secondary institu institutions, particularly UPEI. By bring our, bringing our post-secondary institutions under the Ombudsperson Act, as many Canadian jurisdictions have done before us, we would create an avenue for members of our post-secondary community to raise concerns and to have those concerns investigated externally. The Ombudsperson job, Ombudsperson's job is not to name and shame. 
Rather, the ombudsperson's job is to make sure islanders are treated fairly by public bodies. And where public bodies fall short, the ombudsperson makes recommendations and works with those public bodies to ensure processes are improved and fairness is achieved. I believe this is an outcome that everyone can and should support. We recognize our post-secondary sector is an important part of our province and we are committed to doing our part to ensure there continues to be positive and constructive oversight of island institutions. And before I take questions, I'd like to recognize Lynn Lund for her previous work on this file. She was told that this work would be like kicking a hornet's nest all around and that did not deter her because she knew it was important and she knew she had an intelligent supportive team around her. It was under her that the work for this uh, bill began and she is a trailblazer, and I'm honored to carry this torch on from her. Thank you, Lynn, for being brave and for taking this work head on, even though you knew it wasn't going to be easy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Promoter. Um, so before we get into debate on the bill, uh, is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill now will be read clause by clause, section by section, or just open it up to general questions? General questions was heard, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start by populating my list if you have questions, and I will start first with the Minister of Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, the Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Chair, uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for that opening remarks. And uh, it was, uh, you know, this is important. And, uh, in light of everything that's going on, and I appreciate that. Uh, I just have a few questions. Uh, generally, very supportive of it. But uh, first, of all, I want to start. Nathaniel going to law school, so I hear. So yeah. congratulations. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, excuse my dyslexic tongue, but a mudsman is hard for me to say. So, <laughs> what? When, your conversation with her, I assume you had one. Uh, has there been anything tabled, or is there a letter of support, or what? what is her opinion on, on this? Would you like to yeah. take that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we've had uh, email correspondence with her office pretty much every day, I think, since we announced that we intended to introduce the legislation. Which um, was when? Uh, Friday, I believe, is Friday. when we reached out to post-secondary institutions. And as Carla had mentioned, this was actually something that our office had been looking into for some time, so we were able to actually bring it forward uh, quite quickly after the letter from the ombudsperson was said. Um, as she said uh, on Compass last night, her job isn't to basically recommend policy. Um, she raised it as an option for the legislature, and she believes that it's for the legislature to determine whether we should expand the scope to include post-secondary institutions or not. Um, but that being said, we've had positive um, discussions with her. We've asked how it might impact her office. Uh, she feels that they're basically ready to rock and roll um, if this does pass. Uh, if there are increased demands on her office, she expects it will be because uh, it's coming into force now. People will know that they're now able to uh, file complaints with the ombudsperson office. So. There might be um, an increase in complaints initially, uh, but she expects that to kind of go down over time. And certainly the experience uh, in the Atlantic region is that there aren't very many complaints that are filed in relation to post-secondary institutions. So um, I think it was uh, in, New in Newfoundland, um, I think they had 12 complaints over a period of three years. Um, so it's kind of usually like three years four complaints a year in the Atlantic provinces, so not a whole lot. And of course, that depends on um, the internal processes that institutions have to deal with complaints in the first instance. So if those are solid, it's less likely that you will see complaints uh, later on. Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Thank you, and thank you for that. Um, that was very detailed. and. Uh, and I do have a few questions on the complaint mechanism. So you say it depends on the university on their complaint mechanism. Because what I and most of the taxpayers don't want to see is the ombudsman's uh, office overworked by frivolous, and, and you don't know, yeah. right? It's the unknown that you worry that she's going to be uh, too busy, but you, you think that will be manageable and she thinks that'll be manageable through yep. and policy. I have copies of the emails and maybe we can share those with the members to uh, 
Would you like to table those? We can. Yeah, just one second there, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Finally. So our clerk will uh, get copies of those made and pass them out. Um, while those are being passed out, we'll pass the floor back over to the Agriculture Minister of Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Waste a lot of time just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just for hands or names, can you tell us how this legislation, where this legislation sits, and who ultimately is responsible for this legislation, uh, just just for Hansard and. Uh, okay, so yeah, it would be an amendment to the Ombudsperson Act, so it would be resp the responsibility of the Ombudsperson to administer the legislation, um, and that's overseen by the Legislative Assembly through uh, LMC. Um, I don't know if you're kind of getting at the impact potentially on the institutions, and I can speak to that yeah. as well. So. Um, UPEI, I think, was the one that everyone's kind of interested in. So um, UPEI has a, a bicameral uh, governance structure. So there's a board of governors and there is a senate. So these are both two joint governance bodies of the university. So the board of governors deals with uh, issues of a non-academic nature and the senate deals with issues uh, of an academic nature. So when it comes to complaints, typically there would be processes within the institution already to deal with those. So in the case of the Senate, um, let's say, because I know some people have asked, for example, if a student's upset with their grade, what's the process there? So there is a process internally to deal with that. I believe it goes through the departmental chair and then the dean. Um, and then if there's a further appeal, there's a Senate academic and appeals committee that would hear those. Um, if the student felt that there was uh, an unreasonable decision or the process was unfair, then at that point they could go to the ombudsperson's office and request a review of that decision to make sure that it was reasonable. Um, on the board side, there is a governance and appeals committee of the board um, that would be kind of the top body that would hear complaints if they get escalated to that point. And of course there are other policies in place um, that deal with complaints. And I know the fair treatment ones policy is one that's been discussed um, that's a bit outside of the scope of this legislation. Um, but there are some processes already internally to deal with these complaints, and usually the ombudsperson would try to review these decisions after those uh, avenues have been exhausted. Okay. Honorable Minister and Deputy Premier. So that's interesting. And uh, so it would go, it would, the complaint would see a lot, of, a lot of eyes before it ended up in Edmonds in the office, which is interesting. So, I know you were uh, alumni of EPI and on the student council at one yep. time. President, and president on the board as well. And so, so yep. when you were president, of, I would assume that was in the last ten, yep. ten years. So, would you, would this office have helped in any of your experiences, lived experiences through some of the situations that we've have heard about in the in the report yeah that's a great question and yeah, yeah it, it could have um, again it would depend on the nature of the complaints and the ability um, of individual students or the student union or even any other entity on campus to be able to resolve their concerns um, I think the great part about this is that it's external and that's one of the things we've heard as an issue is that some people might not feel confident in the internal processes of institutions uh, and they want to have someone external who can hear their complaints and determine whether you know they are founded or not. So I think that's really helpful. Um, I think the publicity around it as well, and I know we mentioned it's not to name and shame, but I think knowing in public that there are ways that the institution can improve is a really good tool um, to ensure that the institution moves in the right direction. And I think that's one of the things with the UPI review that's great is that we have access to it. The public knows uh, what issues have been raised, so it is easier to hold the institutions accountable to act on those recommendations. So I think transparency is really good, and I think the approach of the ombudsperson is really good to work collaborative, collaboratively with those uh, institutions to achieve change uh, in the pursuit of fairness. Honorable Minister and Deputy Premier. Uh, final question. Uh, and I'm I really think this is going to be, you know, we were all shocked 
this time last week with uh, this report that's coming out and disheartened. I believe um, sometimes you have to hit rock bottom to build something great and I really hope UPI can uh, turn things around um, in a timely fashion and I think this is one of the tools that they can use. So. I, I am going to support it, fully support it. I, I am a little uh, the rushedness of it, but I understand the circumstances, and I'm sure you're going to learn in law school that <laughs> you shouldn't rush legislation like this, but uh, I know my legal team will be <laughs> are, are never supportive of rush, but I understand the circumstances, and I fully uh, will support this. and. Uh, Best of luck in law school, Nathaniel. Thank you. If I Thank may. you, Minister. Uh, yeah, sorry, Member. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate that, Minister, and I agree. Rushing things is never the answer, and I appreciate the support because when we consider what is happening right now, it's nice to be able to ensure that, like you said, we do have to hit rock bottom, and I would argue that perhaps we aren't quite there yet given, you know, tr as we recoup and kind of <laughs> try to rebuild from here. I, hope. I know that sounds <laughs> terrible, but... Um, and to ensure that there is a place where, where people can go as we work our way through this, I think, is really important. So I, I, I really appreciate where you're coming from there. Thank you, Member. Uh, next, we'll move to the Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing the bill forward. Um, I certainly think it is very important uh, that we have some you know, mechanisms in place, especially something to this nature that makes that impactful, long-lasting, positive change and support for, you know, those working in our post-secondary communities and uh, one that is as well documented is near and dear to me. But um, I do have some questions just with the nature of, of the speed and, and like um, uh, on November mentioned, uh, Deputy Premier, that um, new at this as well. Uh, I'm trying to make sure that I make those uh, good decisions for the whole. I, I, am, I will be supporting this. I do think it is really important, and, and I, I just would be um, even more comfortable once I answer, ask some questions and, and have a little bit more information uh, to share going forward. Um, so yeah. Um, who did you consult prior to drafting the legislation? And that may have already been asked, but I... The prior, you might as well take the prior. Sure. Well, the prior, we didn't actually get to consultation um, because we had <laughs> a pretty ambitious legislative agenda last year. But who we consulted with this time, we notified all of the um, universities on Friday of our intention to bring forward the legislation. Um, we also spoke to BIPOC Usher, who was supportive of the legislation. Um, the UPI Faculty Association also sent a letter in support. and. When we did speak with UPEI, I know one of their concerns um, was around what impact it might have on the governance of the institution, because I know there's been some discussion about um, the University Act and potentially opening that up. And I know from my time at UPEI, anytime the word University Act is mentioned, people would you know, get nervous um, because the institutions really want the autonomy to to govern their own affairs, and they're worried about government kind of coming in and telling them what to do. Um, but we told them this bill doesn't really have, it doesn't change their governance at all. What it does allow is for an external review of decisions or recommendations or actions that they do take uh, to make sure that those were done fairly and that they were reasonable. Um, so it's not, and I think uh, the ombudsperson also communicated that to the university as well. Um, we're not trying to do their job. That's for them to do their job. We're simply here to review it and make sure that things were fair and reasonable. Honorable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. And I know that it was identified in um, the news story last night about other uh, jurisdictions that have this set up. And I guess I'm just <coughs> kind of, like, curious, did you consult any other um, um, per um, persons, offices in other provinces and just to hear what, that, what they're dealing with or how they're managing it? Sure. Um, we didn't directly, the ombudsperson did. Um, what we had done was we looked through their annual reports to see what was the impact on the ombuds offices and other jurisdictions to kind of get a sense of how many complaints would they receive. Um, we found that it wasn't terribly much in the grand scheme of things. And in the ombudsperson's discussions with those other offices, they had the same experience, um, that it wasn't much of a burden on on their offices. 
Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Great, thank you. And I guess I'm just a little bit curious to process, and this might not be for here, because I'm kind of like, like everyone does here, we kind of dance ahead of it, but uh, I'm envisioning the office becoming very busy. One, I'm just thinking, so there's three, um, two very sizable post-secondary institutions, um, College de Lille as well, and then private um, private schools or private, um, any of the additional post-secondaries that those are taken are private entities, they're probably not in this? No, they're not covered. So the ombudsperson has jurisdiction over public bodies. Okay. So usually anything that's publicly funded, they will cover. So yeah, we've um, drafted it in a way that it only applies to our publicly funded institutions. Okay. Uh, Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Great, thank you. And is there a plan or has there been conversations around what will happen if the demand gets intense? I do know the numbers are you know, somewhat lower or, or manageable, I guess. Um, we'd like them to be zero, of course, everywhere, but um, somewhat lower for here. So should the kind of the situation, um, which is so disheartening at, at um, UPI, become bigger? or spread to other institutions, um, is there a bit of a plan, and maybe that's not for here to ask, but is that a bit of a plan to support that demand of that mm -hmm. so that there's not big wait lists? And yeah, no, it's a great question, and it's something we discussed with the ombudsperson, and I know it's in the correspondence we just tabled. Um, what she told us was that if they feel there is a demand and they need to uh, request more resources, they'll do that, um, but they're going to wait and see what they do get, because it is, it's hard to say what might come in the doors as well. And again, um, I think their preference is for issues to be dealt with internally before they come to, to her office. So it, it's hard to say, I guess, what the impact will be, but based on other jurisdictions, it doesn't seem like very much. Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Okay. And just how do we, I guess, are this, will the post-secondary institutions help support like the knowledge around this? Just so that, I think it, I think it's a great, um, something to have, it's excellent for access to post-secondary students, but you know what happens, you know, sometimes we go and we just don't know, and, and we're finding that in, in general population, right? They don't know of some of the great programs that are available. Will the post-secondary institutions lead something to that nature? Um, or who will kind of strive to make sure that that's communicated? And what the process is, I do see a bit of, um, just students may jump the, the, the yeah. steps, right, and head right there, um, maybe feeling uncomfortable to ask those questions, or, or if they're dealing with a situation at the university or college, they may not be comfortable to go through the processes within there. Sorry, that's a bunch of questions sure. in one. No, all great points. Um, I suspect it would be the ombudsperson who would do most of the communication around uh, the, the expanded scope of her office, uh, and that people can file complaints. I also know that, um, although usually in these cases there's a bit of a statutory obligation, sometimes I've seen, for example, in workplace harassment policies, they'll notify people that if they do want to file a complaint, they can do so with the Human Rights Commission. So I would expect the institutions to say, if you're not satisfied with this decision, you have the opportunity to seek a review of this decision through the Ombudsperson Office. Thank you. I just uh, sorry, uh, workforce advanced learning and population. And just closing, not a, a question. Again, I do I do support this. I I am looking for the development and how it uh, rolls out, and that you know um, I'm hoping that it does that impactful, long lasting, positive change in support for for everyone within the post secondary community. And uh, I'm really hoping for great change, especially for our neighboring institution, UPEI, that the things are start to move up from here. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Finance. Just, and this could be a, a pinky thing. I, um, um, and you're the going to be the lawyer, so uh, maybe this is too picky. But um, I was just wondering, and I know, should we have publicly funded in front of a post-secondary institution? I know you list them. Is there ever a chance that one of them becomes not publicly funded? I know the chances of that are probably pretty slim, but is there a reason you left that out? or? I know that's the intent, so sure. I just wonder if that's, is that overdoing it? Yeah, I think the only reference to publicly funded in the legislation is around publicly funded health yeah. entity, which is just health PEI. Yeah. And I think they have to make the distinction there, I would assume, because when it comes to health care, there is a bit of, you know, there's public sector delivery and there's private sector delivery, so they want to be clear about what we're talking about when we talk about publicly funded. Um, we're okay with how this language is drafted because post-secondary institution is simply what's defined in the definition. So if it's not one of the, the clauses yeah. in the definition, it's exempt from the legislation. Okay, thank you. Honorable Minister of Finance, do you have a follow-up or no? No, that's all I need. Over. 
Uh, honorable members, I've exhausted my list unless there are any other questions. Uh, sorry, Summerside Wilmot. Uh, I just got a few questions on it. I like to be informed on anything, and I think it's a great, great motion or a great bill. Uh, I'm just wondering why the rush? Like, why are we given 24 hours to have this? Like, what? We know, I heard you talk about UPI and that. Well, with everything going on in their backyard, we know which way they're going to have to side on this. We know they're going to have to say that they agree with it, but why the rush? Well, we had, this was something, as, as I mentioned in my, my preamble or whatever, that our office had started work on this already, and given the, the heavy legislative agenda that we had, we weren't able to get to it at that time. So it was something that we had planned on bringing forward before. Um, in light of what's happening now at UPEI, I think that this is an opportunity for us to give people a place to go if they're not feeling um, supported or like what's been taken to the to the post-secondary institution has been dealt with fair, equitably, um, and that they feel there's been a fair resolution. So I feel like this is not the end-all be-all to this, but this is just a place to go. And I think the reason that it has to be rushed is because we don't sit again until the fall. And so if we don't sit again until the fall, we're, you know, it's not that, again, this isn't the end-all be-all, but at least we're giving people a place to go until we can you know, um, until this kind of gets figured out, if that answers your question, you might want to add something to that. Uh, the only thing I would add is that there's a bit of a soft limitation period in the Act. It's not a hard rule that the ombudsperson has to follow, but typically they don't like to look at complaints that are more than a year out from when the person would have known about the issue. Um, so that's also, I think, something to be mindful of if we don't, if the House doesn't sit until November, that's potentially five months of complaints um, where, you know, we might not want to review them at that point. But of course, I can't speculate on what the ombudsperson would do, and I think, I trust that if it deserved to be investigated, they would look into it. Summerside Wilma? Uh, just on that, like you're saying, if the House comes back in November, there'd be five months of complaints and all that. So does that mean when this is put in, you're going, you want them to go back? A ways like why would we have that five month backlog if we wait till November is that what about the last five months what about the last year why are we talking about a backlog that wouldn't exist if it wasn't in so I guess if I could try to answer I think um, basically the the concern I suppose would be that if you delay until November, you would look a year back from November rather than a year back from now. Okay. So you could lose potentially part of the review process if there were complaints related to that or any other conduct. But again, it's not a hard limitation period. I think it's just a preference that's written into the legislation, or at least, yeah, I guess, the appropriate way to describe it legally is that they have the authority um, not to review those if it exceeds that limitation window. So. Okay. Summerside Wilmot. Uh, Thank you, Chair. I was just, when I was listening to what you said about corresponding with the, the universities and whatnot, and you sent them out a letter on Friday, today's Wednesday. Every one of them's wide open, full tilt with grad, with everything going on. Like, do you believe that send them a letter on Friday to get their input and doing this on Wednesday is enough time for them to get, probably have to get a board together. One person ain't going to speak for their whole like, you, you honestly feel like that's enough time for them to respond to this? Like, this is who we're affecting. Well, I guess what I would say to that is you're right. It's not enough time. And ideally, we would have taken more time to do this. Um, as was mentioned, we've had contact with the three institutions. All three institutions, well, other than, except for um, UPEI excluded, they've, they've lent their support to this um, because they recognize that as part of the work that they can do and, and to, to prove their commitment to the process and to making UPEI a safer campus. And so we've had um, correspondence with the other two, with Collège de Lille and Holland College, and they are, while they haven't come out, as you say, they have to meet with their boards, so they couldn't come out and give a, a position on this officially. Um, they've both, um, well, Collège de Lille has kind of said, you know, basically, I, I can't see why 
we wouldn't support this. Um, and kind of the correspondence that I get, I won't speak to Holland College just because there hasn't been. I did receive a briefing note um, that, that they are using to talk about what they're doing as an institution. And so really this is strengthening the, um, the, the processes for resolution of concerns and issues. But I, 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 I take your point. I, I totally take your point. Ideally, we don't want to rush this. Um, and this is kind of one of those pieces of legislation where we're dealing with a with an independent office who has brought this forward to us as a legislative assembly as a potential way forward to help us through this, to help us support institutions through this. Um, and so that's why we were kind of felt the, the pressure to do this now. Yeah, and if I could just add, the other thing too is that it doesn't impose any obligations onto the institutions with the exception of complying with investigations of the ombudsperson. Mm -hmm. So they don't really, as soon as this passes, they don't, well, I shouldn't assume, <laughs> I'll let you guys decide whether it passes or not. Uh, but if it does pass, um, there's nothing right away that they have to do. So if there is a complaint, they'll have to work with, um, with the ombudsperson's office. And I know on their website, they do have a really nice Q&A that kind of describes what the obligations of a public agency would be if they do, um, if they are the subject of a complaint. Um, but they work with them collaboratively to address uh, those concerns. So we don't expect any significant impact on the institutions as far as resources. Somerset Wilmot. Uh, and just when we talked about the ombudsperson not thinking that she would have a big spike or I'm trying to read these as I'm listening to you as well. Sure. Uh, when you talked about other jurisdictions, is the sample size comparable to ours? Like, I, how many schools, like, let's take New Brunswick. I think I heard there was eight complaints, maybe. It might have been something like that. Like, is that all the schools in New Brunswick? Like, or is that just one school? Like, what's the sample size in comparison? We keep saying other jurisdictions. Right. So I can give you, I can read off, I have some data. Um, so in Ontario, the most recent year, they had uh, 361 complaints relating to university and 344 complaints relating to colleges. And one caveat with that is that they were in the low 200s the year before. That was due to a lot of COVID policy related complaints around vaccination exemptions. So their numbers were up 70% that year because of COVID related um, issues. Uh, in British Columbia, in the most recent reporting year, they reported uh, 52 complaints relating to universities and 23 complaints relating to colleges. In Newfoundland, where their entire uh, university and college, at least the public institutions, are captured, um, they received, uh, I think, over a period of two or three years, 11 complaints relating to the university and seven complaints relating to the college. In Nova Scotia, which only captures uh, Nova Scotia Community College, they had three complaints in the most recent reporting year. And in New Brunswick, over the last two reporting years, um, five of their complaints related to the community college, um, which is the only institution captured under their uh, legislation that I'm aware of. So not, not a tremendous amount. But again, we'll have to see because, as has been discussed, if people become aware that they have a right to file complaints, some people might exercise that. So you might see. Uh, a spike at the start, but it will tend to kind of wind down over time. Summerside Wilmot. Okay, that that somewhat answers what I was looking for. Uh, if our sizes are comparable, you told me it's only one. I don't know how many people go to Nova Scotia Community College compared to the College of Lille, Holland College, UPEI. Like I sat in that chair for budget questions for the last while, and I watched this whole room scrutinize over $5,000, $10,000. Like, they're scrutinizing a budget, and I'm just quickly trying to get some of these, and I'm reading on here where the ombuds person says, don't think we'll need more people, but if we do, we will ask. Well, that's coming out of a budget somewhere. It's uh, be under legislative assembly, which will have to go through finance and all that, and it's just, like you say, it's going to be new and people know it's there. Hopefully it is just a short spike. It's just, like I say, when you got 24 hours, look at it, not ask questions. It's not in front of a standing committee where you can take everybody in and really ask the questions and see how it pertains to them. It's just, it's hard to fathom how quick it's got to go through. Honorable member, do you have a question? I'm sorry, Chair. 
Somerset Wilma? No, you can have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Sorry. Sure. Um, what is, is there any um, protection, like, like academic freedom, like any of that that's through the post-secondary? Sure. Um, it's an interesting question, and I know that's something that the um, Faculty Association has talked about and will probably um, send those concerns along to the ombudsperson. Um, I think one of the main things to keep in mind is that the ombudsperson doesn't displace decisions of the public body. They can only make recommendations about how to make things fair. So it's really up to the institution to make decisions about how those recommendations might be actioned. So if there are concerns that, you know, the ombudsperson might be, you know, kind of making their own decision that in some way infringes on academic freedom, they can't, they don't have that authority. Min Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. I promise my absolute last question, I promise. Um, you mentioned about supports from the post-secondary institutions, and do you have letters that you'll be tabling or like just documents that they've just written off their support? Um, we have, um, well, there was a public statement from UPEI, I know, today mm -hmm. um, that they issued as a press release. I know Holland College has sent us a letter of what they're doing, and I believe College de Lille was a phone call yeah. with the president. Yeah. So. We could table what we have. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do sure. you want to table that now? Sure. I think I do. <laughs> okay. Somewhere in my package. Yeah. <laughs> I table. I table my file, and I don't think I get it all back. <laughs> Mr. Uh, while uh, our stranger is looking for uh, the document to table. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, follow up? It's a full up? corduroy suit. I said, I'm going to wear the craziest thing I've ever worn on my last. Just to day. take a moment to admire that suit. I don't, I don't know if I have the UPEI one. Um, the UPEI FA? Yeah. I have that. What, what, we, what, we, can, what we can do fall. is uh, we can, we can uh, I'm, assu I'm assuming the honorable member will table the next yes. opportunity she has. Yes. Yeah, Perfect. Absolutely. Or we can circulate it too at some point. Get the Perfect. That would be great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Shall the bill carry? You go to them first, right? I move the title and act to amend the Ombudsperson Act. Shall I carry? No. Hold on, sorry. Uh, okay, I move the title. Uh, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act. Shall I carry? I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall I carry? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall I carry? Thank you. Is this the copy I need to sign or that one? It doesn't really matter. As chair of a committee of the whole house, having head under consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act and Bill Number 104, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The member for Charlottetown Victoria Park. I'm seeking unanimous consent to proceed to third reading of Bill 104, contrary to Rule 66-4. Honourable members, does she have unanimous consent? Yes. yes. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the leader of the third party that Bill 104 be now read a third time. Shall I carry? Bill number 104, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act, read a third time. 
Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the leader of the third party that the said bill do now pass. This is a bill introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to committee of the whole House, reported, agreed to without amendment, read a third time, and is now moved that the bill do pass. All those in favour, say yea. Yay. Contrary, nay. Carried. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. I move. Uh, the Deputy Premier. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I move, seconded by the Minister of Health and Wellness, that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall I carry? I'll ask the Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot to chair Committee of the Whole. The committee of the whole house in. Uh, honourable members, we're on page 86, PI Public Service Commission. Did the minister want to call a stranger to the floor? Shall I carry? <laughs> and if the stranger could state her name and position for answer, please. Sherry McCourt, Director of Administration, Corporate HRMS and Payroll with the Public Service Commission. Thank you, Sharon. Employee Assistance Program. Appropriations provided for confidential assistance to employees within the civil service, health and education sectors whose job performance is or has the potential to be adversely affected by work-related or personal challenges. Administration, 7,200. Equipment, 3,800. Material supplies and services, 1,000. Professional services, 1,300. Salaries, 477,900. Travel and training, 5,700. And total employee assistance program, 496,900. Leader of the third party. Thank you again, Thank you. and you too, Minister. What assistance is available to civil servants through the EAP? Uh, it's available to all the employees and family across the civil, mm -hmm. health, and education. Okay. Leader of the That's party. the only question I have for this section. Shall I carry? Language Training Center. Appropriation provided for delivery of French language training services to prov provincial public servants. Administration, 1,500. Equipment, 2,500. Material supplies and services, 3,600. Salaries, 189,200. Travel and training, 321,400. 
Total Language Training Center, 518,200. Chair. Leader to the third party. Thank you. Do we have a sense of how many civil servants are actually able to provide services en français? Um, it's in the annual report, but it's close to 100. 100, okay. Yeah. Leader to the third party. Do you have, is that sort of fairly evenly distributed across departments, or do we have some departments where there's a real lack of French service capability? I'd have to, I'd have to take that back. Leader of third party. And does the PSC have targets for how many new civil servants um, it hopes to train to the level to be able to provide French services each year? It's a departmental choice. They designate the positions to be yep. bilingual, and then we just go through the hiring process. Right. So there's not a set target for the PSC to increase the complement, but we do have training, and we have the French language training program that supports people who do sure. want to be trained. Leader of third party. Thanks, Chair. And the last question on this section. Are those numbers going up or down, or is it pretty steady? Going up. Okay, that's Yeah, great. we had a number of um, this past fiscal, and you'll see it in the end report, but the people that are enrolled and the employees that are enrolled into the training programs, the numbers have gone up, and they're completing the courses substantially. That's great. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Charles Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, under travel train, there's a large increase uh, budgeted for, for next year. Can you just <laughs> talk about what that is for? That is, uh, there was a, an incentive, it's called the, well, it's just a French language training program, an incentive program, so we received 250000 in our budget this year, and right now the French language program team are pulling together the program itself and what it's going to be about. But so there's funding there for incentives for employees to complete, you know, the French training programs, and as well an administrative support sufficient position to support the program. Charlton West Royalty. That's a that's obviously a federal government has, has given two hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, that no? came from our. Oh, government. perfect. Um, no, that's that's uh, that's really good to see that investment in French language training. So that was the only question I had. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Shall I carry? Total staffing classification organizational development five million one hundred three thousand five hundred. Shall I carry? Carry. Administration, Corporate, HRMS, and Payroll. Administration, Corporate, HRMS, and Payroll. Appropriations provided for provision of advice and assistance to ensure appropriate personnel administration for the Civil Service and Payroll Administration for the Civil. Health and Education Sectors, as well as the Management of Corporate Human Resource Systems. Administration, 24,300. Equipment, 9,600. Material supplies and services, 4,400. Professional services, 500,000. Salaries, 877,300. Travel and training, 440,300. Geraldine West Royalty. Yeah, just a question on um, professional services. Uh, this is the first time it's been budgeted, and just yeah. an explanation of what the half a million dollars is going to go towards. It's for our. Um, we have a like a recruitment system in play now with the government, and this is for the replacement. So it's called an applicant tracking system. So it's a multi-phase project over this fiscal and potentially next next fiscal, and this year we're just looking at uh, setting the stage to procure the applicant tracking system. Charlton West Royalty. Will that help with recruit recruiting across the board? Or yes. Is, so, yes. So it's it's an exploration money. When when do you foresee that being in? Is it something easy to put in place, or is it? There is products out there. So this year we're uh, doing the requirements, going to RFP, RFP, doing the contract negotiations, and hopefully we'll have. Uh, a vendor secured by next fiscal, and then looking at April 2024 for implementation. Charlton West Royalty. So there's half a million here. How how much are these? Usually, how much are these systems? Are we looking at a million dollars here? In the Could it? It depends on our requirements. Yeah. And um, they have all flavors, and they have lots of offers, right? So we'll yeah. be picking the packages all that offers. are reflective of the requirements that we post in our RFP. Yeah, and that's it's necessary to keep up with yeah. the Joneses <laughs> and to make sure that because other other places are. So that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Corporate HRMS and payroll one million eight hundred fifty five thousand nine hundred. Shall it carry? Right. Total administration corporate HRMS and payroll one million eight fifty five nine hundred. Shall it carry? 
Total PEI Public Service Commission, 11,473,100. Shall I carry? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this was 74. Chair? Actually, we should table this um, document. It's kind of the support document for that budget. I think you already had a copy of it anyway, Thanks. but we just want to table it. Sorry, Minister, I never asked you if you want to table it at yeah, the start. I That's forgot to, me. so. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And did the Minister have a stranger that you want to take to the floor? Okay. Shall it be granted? <laughs> Okay, members, we are on page 74, Department of Finance. If the stranger could state her name and position for Hansard, please. It's Vicki Hamilton, Director of Finance for the Department of Finance. Thank you very much, Vicki. Department Management. Oh, sorry, did you have anything that you want to table? Yes. Yes, we do. Yeah, good catch. <laughs> Ain't going to do a two in a row. Sarletown Winslow will correct me. Department Management, Corporate Services, appropriations provided for operation of the Ministers and the Deputy Ministers' Offices, Administration, 9,900, Equipment, 1,500, Material Supplies and Services, 13,500, Professional Services, 2,500, Salaries, 726,700, Travel and Training, 56,200, Total cor corporate services, 810,300. Leader of the third party. Is this where we would find out details? Of, we, we asked these questions in health, and it was about the federal transfer, the extra money for health. Is this the department I should ask about, the section I should ask about that? Um, well, that would fall under revenue, not an expenditure budget. Um, I can oh, okay. try and answer a revenue question for you, but it's not within any section that we're going to be discussing. Okay, that's that's fine then. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'm good. Shall I carry? Here. Total department management, 810,300. Shall I carry? Here. Pension and capital management, debt and investment management, appropriations provided to manage the provincial debt, sink and fund, cash management operations, and pension fund assets. Administration, 7,400. Equipment, 4,000. Material supplies and services, 6,000. Professional services, 115,300. Salaries, 418,800. Travel and training, 15,600. Total debt and investment management, 567,100. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Can you tell me what the, what the provincial debt right now? I, I believe it's in the area of 160 to 180 million, but she can confirm. The, the actual debt, so that's actually an interest charges on debt section. Could we it, it, okay. wait until that section? Sure, I'll ask questions in a few pages. Okay. Shall I carry? Oh, no. Sorry, later third party. So according to the budget um, speech, uh, we're not going to see uh, any end to these deficits for a few years. Do you have uh, any idea when we are actually going to see a surplus here. Any projections on that? I think our goal as a government is to um, make the investments this year, much like I said, we're, we're making the big investments where, where we need the money right now, health, housing, affordability, um, with goals of getting back to budget or very close to um, within the next four years. Four years? Okay. Chair? Later, third party. Thanks. Can you tell us how much of our provincial pension fund is invested in fossil fuels? We do have that, actually. Excellent. It's very small. Uh, 0.67%. Wow. Yeah. Later, third party. Final question on this. The um, 
ESG principles, that's environment, social and governance principles, are something that many people in institutions apply to their investments. Is that something that the provincial government does? Um, I'm, I'm, I haven't read the Statement of Investment Policies and Procedures, but I think it's laid out what, what rules they need to follow, and that is a public document. Um, but I don't okay. have any more detail on it. All right, so I should be able to find that somewhere. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's both on the um, public sector pension plan site and the teacher's pension plan website. Okay. I'm good for the section. Thank you, Chair. Shall I carry? Pension and benefits. Appropriations provided for administration of pension benefit programs, which includes advising employees on a variety of programs, informing government of the financial direction of these programs, and overseeing the costs and delivery of employee benefit packages. Administration, 10200 Equipment, 4000 Material supplies and services, 9600 Salaries, 1464300 Travel and training, 18,100. Total pension and benefits, 1,506,200. Shall it carry? Carry. Total pension and capital management, 2,073,300. Shall it carry? Carry. Economic statistics and federal fiscal relations. Appropriations provided for policy advice on federal fiscal matters, including major transfers and tax issues, economic analysis and statistics. This division includes grants for income and sales tax credits and rebates. Administration, 163,400. Equipment, 1,700. Material supplies and services, 2,400. Professional services, 115,000. Salaries, 673,300. Travel and training, 22,000. Grants, 9,265,000. Total economics, statistics, and federal fiscal relations, 10,242,800. Leader of the third party. Thank you so much, Chair. So we have three economists in this, as I can see under this section, funded under this section. I'm wondering if they provide um, economic analysis just to the finance department or to other parts of government? They're the statistics bureau for all of government, so, okay. so any projects that come up, whether it's related to diversity or taxation model, anything that they rely on this section to, to help with statistical information. Okay. Yeah. Leader of third party. So the proposed, and I haven't heard any details on it yet, of looking at the tax brackets, for example, they would be the people who would be mm -hmm. doing the analysis yes. for yes. that. Okay. And the director will be discussing the bill mm -hmm. when it comes okay. forward. Leader of third party. And is that true for when something like uh, tax changes on vaping products or tobacco products, would they also do an analysis of the, you know, whether the cost-benefit analysis of when the tax gets to a point where it's actually not creating more revenue, that's not the only thing we should be looking at there, but would they do that analysis? This, this section works in conjunction with the other departments, so certainly within finance, the Director of Economic Statistics and Fiscal Relations would work with the tax commissioner and coordinate their work to do the analysis that's required. So they don't, they don't work in silos, they work they work together with whatever department is responsible for any changes like you referenced. Okay. Leader of third party. So the uh, tax bracket review, which is something that's been long overdue here for, you know, when can we expect, is there funding here specifically for that? And when can we expect that to be completed and, in, and implemented? Yeah, we're, well, we're making the first um, phase, the first um, this year, right? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're um, we, we, right after we did the, um, we tabled the budget, we actually did the, um, put the first reading of the legislation in to change the Income Tax um, Act. So that's, that's going to happen here, um, right, in yeah. the next I think it's day on the or for today. Yeah, for maybe even for <laughs> later today. Yeah. Okay. Leader of third party. 
I'm sorry, I, and I should know that because we're about to debate it imminently. <laughs> but so that's more than just the basic personal amount. The it's more. rising of that. There are other implications. So there's the basic personal amount, and then there's actually changing of the brackets. Okay, and, fantastic. And, and actually, the rates associated with each bracket. Excellent. I look forward to getting mm -hmm. to that. I just haven't looked through it clearly. Um, <laughs> I have not looked through it carefully enough to this point. Um, I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Shella Carey. Office of the Controller, Financial Information System Accounting and Procurement. Appropriations provided for the controllership services to government, which include maintenance of the province's accounts, preparation of the public accounts, auditing and monitoring of related revenues and expenditures, and operating policy over the province's financial information system. Appropriations are also provided for the procurement of goods on behalf of departments and agencies. Administration, 23,400. Debt, nil. Equipment, 5,700. Material supplies and services, 5,600. Professional services, 25,600. Salaries, 2,044,000. Travel and training, 13,400. Total financial information system, accounting and procurement, 2,117,700. Shall I? Oh, leader of the third party. We made some updates or amendments to the procurement legislation a little while ago. How, how far along are we with implementation? <coughs> I think the, the act is, is being followed. I don't think there's any, any lag in, in implementation. Okay, it's yeah. all done. Okay, great. Um, Leader of the third party. Thanks. Can you tell us which what positions are being added in new salaries? We're up what, half a million dollars. Um, so the increase, the budget to budget variance of one hundred and fifty-seven thousand. Right. Is just collective agreement increases, and we actually had eight positions that were reclassified based on their revised uh, position questionnaires. Okay, chair. Sure. Leader of third party. Uh, just looking at the forecast compared to estimate last year, we were down almost four, well, 360,000. Yes. Was that because there were vacancies? In we the had department? three positions that were vacant for the full year and two positions that were vacant for part of the year. Leader of third party. Are they now filled vacant? Um, we have filled uh, two. We were short two accountants, and they have both been recently filled. I don't think they've started yet, but they're filled <laughs> recently, thank goodness. So the comptroller's very happy that she has her compliment back. I bet she is. <laughs> Leader of third party. Uh, I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall I carry? Total office of the controller, 2117700 Shall I carry? Taxation and property records. Administration. Appropriations provided for administration, tax audit, collection and inspection activities, tax processing, tax information and interpretation, registry of deeds and mapping services, property assessment and geometric services, administration, 85,500, debt, 400,000, equipment, 25,500, material supplies and services, 79,000, professional services, 102,000, Salaries, 4,786,500. Travel and training, 94,500. Total administration, 5,573,000. Leader of the opposition. The reason for that? Sure. Um, we um, had a delay. We were doing a document scanning project, and that was delayed because there was a uh, staff vacancies, so they, they weren't able to get that work done. And then we also had vape tax and mark fuel work that was delayed um, because we're now looking at joining with the feds, so we, we didn't have to expend those dollars on our own professional services related to to vape tax. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So why is it, if, if that's the case, there would be, you're budgeting again this year for the same as what you budgeted last year, will Will you be spending less money for professional services because of those two um, reasons? Well, we have the, 
and I, I shouldn't I don't know too much about the the intricacies of the vape tax and, mm -hmm. and the coordination with the federal government but um, there was a delay this year because the feds aren't ready to roll it out so part of that money would move to next fiscal and then the document scanning project is still ramping up we're trying to convert everything from to digital so we have we have everything that's <laughs> Leader of the opposition. When do you see that uh, document scanning project be completed? I'm. I don't have any details on mm -hmm. that. I know. I, I'm not sure what year they're at even. Okay, that's fine. Leader of the third party. Thank you, uh, Minister. You mentioned, uh, and I don't remember what the debate was, but recently that CRA actually has better tax and property records than we do, or information. And I'm wondering what they have that we don't. I don't remember saying that. And I can't remember the discussion we were having. Um, it, I think it was better income and tax data, perhaps. Maybe it was related to refunds that were being given out. It wouldn't have anything to do with, with our taxation and property records. Maybe from a, from a corporate or a personal income tax, but not on our property tax. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll move on from that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, uh, the only thing I can think of um, is uh, maybe during that housing statistics um, conversation, like we did kind of integrate data with um, with the feds. Okay. Uh, so we're, PEI kind of signed on so that we can we can send some data of our, our, of our okay. own to the feds to, to be able to take part in that particular statistic program, statistic, statistical program. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Minister. Yeah. Chair. Leader of the third party. Are there any efforts underway to monitor potential property speculation here on Prince Edward Island? We know other provinces have in, have dealt with that, and in order to deal with it effectively, you'd have to have data. Yeah, well, I know um, um, one thing that um, we've talked about in here that I, I'm excited about because it's it, within my background is um, incorporating more GIS. Um, into this, so to be able to visualize the data, I think would be, you know, you have to have the good data set first, but to be able to integrate it into a GIS and be able to visually and, and do some analysis on that data is something that they're, they're looking to do in the future, which is exciting. Okay. It, Leader of third party. And speaking of modernizing the way we keep records, Geolink is just so awful. Yeah. Is there, are there any plans to improve the way that Islanders, well, and anybody actually can access property records? Please say yes. They just did an upgrade, I would say, with Geolink, and, and this is another space that I'm fairly comfortable. But um, So I would say, just in my own personal usage of that software, that the upgrade um, absolutely did make a difference, no question. I think any user that would use it would identify that upgrade as a positive step. Um, yeah. Leader of third party. So the, the plan, I guess, is not to move away from Geolink, but just to tweak it and improve it? I haven't used it very recently, I yeah. must say, so I can't yeah. speak to that, but oh my the, goodness. The upgrades so. were significant, I would say. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I, I think that we're at a good space right now. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go home tonight and give it a go. Give it a go. <laughs> I think yeah. it went live November 1st, yeah. the, new, the new system. So. Okay. It's also yeah. subscription-based now, as opposed to before every click was... 25 cents or a dollar and, right. and it, so it's subscription based now so uh, that is nice for a user um, um, in, in my particular perspective there may be people that have a different one but um, um, yeah no I, I think if you give it a try you'll see a okay. you'll see a positive difference leader of third party Can I just ask on that then minister what how, how much does it cost to get a subscription to access to oh. or different levels presumably I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't have that information right in front of me. Okay. All right. If you go on there, it'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's fine. No, yeah. I'd yeah. ask while we were here. Yeah. I'm good for the section. Shall it carry? Yeah. Treasury Board Secretariat. Administration. Appropriations provided for Treasury Board operations, fiscal management, and secretary to Treasury Board, including appropriations provided for preparation of the budget estimates and forecast documents, and providing analytical support and advice to Treasury Board and government on financial matters. Administration, 13,000. Equipment, 5,000. Material supplies and services, 4,700. Professional services, 5,000. Salaries, 1,005,900. 
Travel and training, 7,100. Total administration, 1,040,700. Leader of the third party. Well, I guess it is a budget related thing, but why are Treasury Board policies not publicly available? Is there a reason for so that? I do have a little note on that. Policies are the responsibility of Treasury Board and managed by the staff that support the board on behalf of government. And I can check with the status. I know that they they have been updating a lot of the policies. So but I don't know the status of what their current plans are for posting them. Okay. Leader of third party. And is that typical? Like, uh, do other jurisdictions, other provinces not have their Treasury Board policies publicly available? I'm not I don't, sure. I don't know the answer to that. Either. I'm not sure. Um, I, I do know in, in a couple of conversations that I think the idea is that we would make all the, we would do all the modernization of the policies, make sure they're good to go, and I think the end, the outcome is that they would be made public at that point. I think they're just working on it right okay. now. Okay. Leader of third party. And uh, I'm delighted to hear that, Minister. Do you have a sense of when the end date for that would be, when they, they will be made public? I don't know that. No, okay. I, I, I don't think it's going to be years away or anything like that, I, but um, they're working on it now. Okay. I'm good for the section. Thank you. Shall I carry? Corporate finance. Appropriations provided for administration and management of financial and budgeting matters for departments and crown agencies. Administration, 28900 Equipment, 1000 Material supplies and services, 3900 Salaries, 6182100 Travel and training, 21300 Total corporate finance, 6237200 Shall I carry? Oh, leader of the third party. Thanks. I'm wondering if you can give us any more information on the power surge that happened a couple of weeks ago and caused all of the, those outages, and also if there's any expenditures in here to deal with that. I presume not. Sure. That's under ITSS, yeah. just next the one. next section. Okay. Uh, I'm fine then. Shall I carry? <laughs> Information Technology Shared Services. Appropriations provided for the administration and management of the corporate IT shared services. This includes corporate, enterprise, architecture, business infrastructure, business application services, digital services delivery, security services, and document publishing center, King's Printer. Administration. 1,204,800. Equipment, 250,600. Material supplies and services, 17,076,400. Professional services, 5,807,100. Salaries, 25,278,700. Travel and training, 692,000. Total information technology shared services, 50,309,600. Leader of the third party. <laughs> uh, just wondering if there are funds set aside to deal with that power surge. So um, all systems are currently operating as normal and there was no electronic data loss to the outage okay. and the costs were approximately 22,000 and that included some overtime for staff and replacement parts. Okay. Leader of third party. That's a lot less than I expected. Yeah. I, th I thought you were going to give me a big number there. <laughs> so where are our servers located? And has Maritime Electric ever explained how a power surge got through the system to the point where it caused such damage? Um, I think it wouldn't be necessarily appropriate for us to disclose publicly where our servers are located. Um, That's so fair. I'll start with okay. I'll start with yeah. um, I don't know if Maritime Electric um, ever made a, from from our standpoint and what I know is that it was these power surges, power bumps that came through the lines and kind of um, impacted our, our surge, our protection equipment our, that was kind of in front of our servers. So um, it, it did the job it had to do. Um, um, it protected um, what we had there. So, but no, I, I don't know the explanation from Maritime Electric side of, of exactly what happened. We just know it was a couple of bumps, a couple of power surges. Yeah. Okay. 
Leader of the third party. So just so I'm clear on that, Minister, and I appreciate the explanation, by the way. So there were multiple power bumps, and the first one knocked out the safety system that was meant to protect everything else? Is that I think happened? there was two. And, and um, I think that's what I heard, was that there was kind of two bumps that came through. But the... The um, the protective the surge equipment did its job. It protected from both of them. Yeah. Okay. Leader of the third party. I guess I'm wondering why so much damage was done. There apparent so much damage. Apparently, so much damage was done. Like when the power surge happened, then the systems the system shut down like without a proper shutdown. So there was time to bring them back up and make sure everything like that there was no damage was. Mm -hmm was more the precaution than trying to boot everything back up at once when it hadn't been shut down properly. Okay. Yeah. Leader of third party. Thanks, Chair. So I'll go back to my original question because you, uh, clearly Maritime Electric is responsible for maintaining the regularity of the current that we get to our, you know, wherever it is. And have they ever explained to you what went wrong here? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's something we could bring back. If we could see what the team said, we could bring something like that back to you if that, if that would help. Sure. Yeah. Leader of I, I don't party. know if they have the information either, but I'll, I'll sure. see. Leader of the third party. Uh, I assume somebody somewhere yeah. would know what the source of the problem was. I'm, I'm just a concern that that's going to happen again because it was, you know, several days and it was quite an inconvenience. But, you know, could, maybe things would be worse next time or maybe mm -hmm. other parts of the system would be hit. So it would be really nice to know. And get also get Maritime Electric to pay that bill. It's their fault that the thing went down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I think the other note there too, and, and not to um, drag this on further, but I, I think that there is a move too, and I think I, I said that already publicly to look at cloud, to, you know, to look to the cloud to help us in, in those certain. Leader of the third that's party. That's my very next question. <laughs> Do we use cloud storage, is it, or is it all online? Uh, is it all physical storage? It's a combination, depending on on the work and the security level and whatnot. So we do still have on-prem um, storage as well as some cloud storage. Okay. Thank Maybe you, Chair. Third party. It's a big section and it's important because it supports so many other government services. That's why I'm asking a number of questions here. Does e ITSS work on the electronic medical records system in any way? Um, we do have some support staff that are assigned to the project, but we don't manage the project. Okay. All right. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, King's Printer, has the workload been increased there, or are they pretty well on par with other years for the amount of work they have ahead? Um, I don't have any stats related to the number of print jobs, so we do publish that yeah. type of information in our annual report. I have the 21-22 stats if you're interested as far as what they, the number yeah. of jobs that they print. The only thing I would say is that there's, you know, there's rising cost with printing and postage, but on the downside we're seeing more scanning and less mailing, so there's a bit of an offset there. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chairman. Just asking because I mean, I um, I'm hearing there's some printing that's taken even a couple of months to get really? through, and that there's possible outsourcing. Is that correct? <laughs> I think he's worried about his sympathy cards. Oh. <laughs> no, that we got them. We got them. No, Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. What What I will say, um, I I. Yeah, that they're busy, but what they what's impressive is I did a tour here not lately mm -hmm. of this shop, and they have integrated um, the Lean Six Sigma program there, and um, and I hope I said that right, but um, did I? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and their shop is super super organized um, and and managed really well. It was it it was super impressive to walk through and see the systems they had in place. Um, so they are doing um, everything they can to streamline the to process. streamline the process. And Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Sarah. So I want to make it clear: I'm not questioning the staff's no, abilities. No, no, yeah. It's just the amount of work that they have to do. Um, has that increased? Is what it, my ask was. 
I don't and, have that. And again, I don't, I don't have the specifics of the stats, um, which will be published. Like a, that's really the only way to gauge, I guess, is the number of print jobs and, and okay. things of that nature that you could. Leader of the opposition. Okay, and a couple of budget line uh, questions. So material supplies and services, um, there's an increase in this year's budget of uh, two million. Um, could you tell me what the purpose of that is? The, the budget to budget, 1.1 million. 1.1. One. Mm -hmm, yeah. So uh, the majority of that relates to the Microsoft uh, Office 365 subscriptions. So as we've converted the majority of government right. now, so um, those subscriptions are an operating cost where before they were they were owned licenses. Okay. So um, that's been ongoing for a number of years. Leader of the opposition. So is that a, you said it's, it's ongoing for a number of years. So um, <coughs> can you just explain that? Like, is, it's not a one-time subscription. No, it's a it's a annual subscription for the uh -huh. license. So as more people are converted, then you have more monthly the process subscription is going costs. On. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Just one more on salaries. So there was an underspend last year, and then you're up 400, four, I guess I don't even do my math well. Almost four million. Mm. Could you explain that? What the underspend was for? Was there vacancies, and if there were new hires? Sure. So for the budget forecast mm -hmm. variance, the the two million dollar decrease, we actually had eighty six positions that were vacant at certain points throughout the year. So okay. there's, wow. yeah, there's um, a lot of uh, temporary assignments mm -hmm. or um, movement within the yeah. department or the section, so, um, and they could be for a number of reasons, maternity leave, sick leave, and whatnot. So um, we did backfill some of those by attempts, or we had to do professional contracts, uh, outsource that work if it was project-related that had to keep moving. Um, so that's basically why we had the decrease in the forecast. The increase from budget to budget, um, <coughs> We have 49 new positions, and uh, we have four for EMR support, seven for patient medical homes, six for additional overall health supports, three for the web digital office, and uh, we had 29 temp positions converted to permanent based on the growing and ongoing needs in the department, so that was really good for for planning and to retain our staff to be able to convert those temporary positions to permanent. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. So you have 49 new positions. That's over and above the 86 that were vacant? Yes. So, yes, last year we had a, we had a lot of vacancies. We've mm -hmm. done a lot of work as you and, and a lot of um, different avenues to try and fill the positions. We did a lot of work last year. You've probably seen a lot of the different Mm -hmm. ads that have gone on so as of the time I printed my book we still had we only had 46 vacancies Total now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cheryl, thank you. yeah um, in, the, in the big book uh, number 25 which says health social development and housing case management system support two hundred and eighty three thousand dollars can you tell me what that's for so it's a case management system used by 18 different program areas in health uh, and social development. Um, it's also a financial system and processes payments for clients who are on financial assistance. Okay, perfect. Cheryl, down West Royalty. So that, that 280000 that was for 22-23? Yes. Um, is that an ongoing cost or is that a startup cost? No, those are ongoing maintenance costs for any changes or support. So we support... Um, you can see the, in the handout they're broken down between kind of consulting services and then computer services. So the consulting piece would vary depending on what projects are on the go from any given department that we're supporting. The computer services are more ongoing support for all the systems across government that require upgrades, fixes, patches, anything of that nature. Okay, perfect. Um, Cheryl Town, West Royal. Just a, this is a kind of a group question. Maybe the minister can bring it back, but I'll let Line 10, 11, uh, 16, senior development. Uh, when, I, when I see these in, in consult, in the consult, consultation area, I get kind of a little bit 
Nerva Senior Development, Project Manager Senior Development. These are all for big numbers, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Mm -hmm. Was that for something in, in general in particular? Um, salaries are up, but we see that maybe consultation services are up too. So this is kind of what I referred to for the other question of why their salaries were lower um, budget to forecast yeah. was because we couldn't hire, we couldn't fill the positions internally. So if, if we had uh, projects that had to move forward, we had to hire external consulting, which shows up in the oh. consulting line instead of the salary line. Yeah. Charlton, what's wrong? That's quite a bit more expensive to do it that way, I would take I would imagine. It is. So, That's yeah. why we're trying hard to get our, our yeah. positions yeah. class properly and posted. Yeah, well thank you very much. That's Shall a very section. Shella Carey. Total Treasury Board Secretariat, fifty seven million five hundred eighty seven thousand five hundred. Shella Carey. Total Department of Finance. 78,404,600. Shall it carry? On employee benefits. Employee benefits. Appropriations provided for government's portion of costs associated with providing employee benefits program. Medical life benefits, 508,000. Employee future benefits, 18,302,000. Government pension expense, 32,402,000. Pension management, 498,000. Total employee benefits, 51,700, pardon me, 51,710,000. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Just one simple question. The numbers sort of fluctuate all over the place, but generally we're down 13 million. Is there a reason for it? I'm sure there are many reasons, but why is that? Yeah. The the main reason is because um, as interest rates or what we call discount rates in this particular yep. section, as they go up, um, our cost goes down because we're present valuing those future costs. So the higher the interest rate, the lower the current value is. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. It, it works the opposite with the debt, but on the future benefit liability, right. our, our present cost is less. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that perfect explanation. <laughs> I'm good for the section. Shall I carry? General government. Miscellaneous general. Appropriations provided for the premier and ministers out of province travel, cabinet, protocol gifts, and other meeting expenses. Administration, 60,000. Material supplies and services, 35,000. Professional services, 35,000. Travel and training, 100,000. Total miscellaneous general, 230,000. Leader of the opposition. Question the line for administration on underspend uh, from 60,000 to 12,000. Can you explain what that reason was? Um, I don't have many details, but those, it includes like hosting uh, entertainment. Um, ceremony and protocol related expenses okay. and I don't believe we had too much for protocol this year. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Thank you. The other line is travel and training was an overspend of 45000 What was that for? Uh, the overspend in travel, um, I don't have the specifics. Um, each, each minister's travel would, would have been tabled under each department mm -hmm. section and then um, they get oh, reimbursed waiting. through here so um, all the all the travel reports that are publicly disclosed would show up here so there was more traveling this year than last year because of covid and it's it's all relates to travel for the premier uh, or traveling ministers traveling on the premier's behalf Leader of the opposition. So if there's more traveling this year because of COVID restrictions prior, why is the budget estimate this year back to what it was in 2022-23? Um, there wasn't any request for an increase, so. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Cheryl Dan Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I just have one question. Um, and it kind of goes, I guess, for, for the whole thing of general government. I'm just wondering how this is documented in the blue books. Or is it documented in the blue books? Um, 
can you expand on that? What what particular? What so I, I'm wondering, <laughs> like, because it's you know we're just kind of seeing we don't see a whole lot of detail. So I'm wondering, is this something that I guess the Auditor General has more information on? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. So it may be summarized here, and as we go through each section, you may ask some more questions, but. Um, they they do a uh, complete review of of all these expenditures just as they would any other department. Great. This is where they did the large COVID audit there yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah, great. Thank you, Chair. Shall I carry? Carry. Grants appropriations provided for grants in lieu of property tax. Grants two million one hundred thousand. Total grants two million one hundred thousand. Shall I carry? Carry. Government insurance program. Appropriations provided for insurance premiums to the self-insurance fund and outside insurers. Self-retained losses assumed by government and for a risk management council. The program provides insurance to all government department and various crown corporations and reporting entities. Administration, 3,872,000. Total government insurance program, 3,872,000. Shall it carry? Contingency fund and salary negotiations. Appropriations provided for provincial government funding of unforeseen program requirements and projected salary negotiations within the public service. Grants and salaries, 10,968,100. Total contingency fund and salary negotiations, 10,968,100. Leader of the third party. So have we baked into that number the potential impact of cost of living increases? In other words, are you expecting that to influence contract negotiations going forward? Well, we, we don't discuss details of any ongoing negotiations, so this is made up of open... I'm at a loss for its open contracts, as well as a general contingency outside of the big buckets that we'll get to in the next section. Leader of the third party. And again, the numbers fluctuate a lot. So could you give us just a very brief explanation of why we went from 5 million to 16 last year? Um, well, there, I think when the forecast was set, we, weren't sh we didn't know what the outcome of the bargaining was going to be so we estimated at that time I'm not sure where it actually came in versus what the estimate was but that's for for all open contracts <laughs> for that <are> up for renewal <laughs> leader of the third party thank you so was that big discrepancy last year a result of the cost of living increases and in inflation um, well it's it's a combination of both a general contingency and salary negotiations and it's loop it's grouped together so I don't have the specifics between what was salary versus what was general okay. contingency all right I'm good for this section Thank shall you. I carry Here. response and recovery recovery contingencies appropriations provided for expenditures related to government's ongoing response to extraordinary non reoccurring events program contingencies 32,062,000. Total response and recovery contingencies, 32,062,000. Shall I carry? Leader of the third party. Thank you. And, uh, obviously, these are by their very nature unpredictable things, but we've seen in the last few years consistent overspending. And I see we've actually, you know, obviously it's gone up a tiny bit from, from uh, last year. Uh, do you... Why, why is that figure not significantly larger, given what the experiences of the last few years are? Well, it is a contingency, and I guess, um, did you want me to talk specifically of what's included in the 23-24 budget, or just? No, just really that it seems clear that these um, events are happening more frequently and, more, and with greater severity, and therefore it's costing our treasury more and that's not it's not these things don't happen 
apparently randomly anymore, it seems like every year, whether it's a hurricane or wildfires mm. or a tropical storm or whatever it is. Um, and I'm wondering why the contingency fund doesn't sort of reflect the greater frequency and severity of these events. Well, I, I think that would be hard to estimate, mm -hmm. right? Um, sure. I, so that's a that would be a difficult thing to square um, in a budget to anticipate um, a certain type of disaster and put a number to it, right? I, I would think that that would be difficult, um, and maybe, Absolutely. maybe that's... Well, I, I mean, we always hope we don't have to use the yeah. contingency fund. Now, and, and we do go out and we try and do estimates based on what we know, but yes, the last couple of years we've had to come back for special warrants because of the circumstances mm -hmm. that have arisen after the budget was yep. passed. So, you know, I think we've covered off in, in this this part of, you know, residual uh, Fiona, residual potato wart, those types of big ticket items. Um, and if something huge arises again, then, then we'll be back the way we were of previously course. for the inflationary payments and, yep. and the COVID payments. Yep. I'm good for this section. Thank you. Shall I carry? Sure. Total general government, 49232100 Shall I carry? Sure. Interest charges on debt. Interest. Appropriations provided for the funding of interest costs associated with monies borrowed by the way of insurance of provincial debentures, treasury notes, as well as borrowing through the use of bank lines of credit and loans from the Canada Pension Plan. Debentures, $111,788,400. Loans and Treasury notes, thirty-seven million two hundred forty-three thousand two hundred. Total interest, one hundred forty-nine million thirty-one thousand six hundred. Shall I carry? Promissory note for pension funds. Interest costs associated with the promissory notes provided to the pension funds. Interest. Thirteen million six hundred sixty-seven thousand nine hundred total promissory notes for pension funds. Thirteen million six hundred sixty-seven thousand nine hundred. Shall I carry? Yeah, yeah. Total interest charges on debt: one hundred sixty-two million six hundred ninety-nine thousand five hundred. Shall I carry? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vicki. All right, members, uh, we are on page 180. Uh, that guy doesn't need permission to come on the, the floor. You're a stranger. I don't think he does need permission, so we don't have to grant it. Velosky, the uh, clerk, doesn't need permission to come on the floor, does he? Perfect. Uh, we are on page 180. And uh, for our stranger, I will get you to say your name and your title for Hanser, please. Joseph Jeffrey, the Legislative Assembly. Welcome, uh, Joey. 
The legislative services uh, appropriations provided for costs associated with the general functioning of the clerk's office, the speaker's office, and the operation of the sessions of the legislature. Administration, 194500 Equipment, 97500 Materials, supplies, and services, 278000 Professional services, 30000 Salaries, 2357500 Travel and training, 65,000. Total legislative services, 3,022,500. Shall the section carry? Chair, Chair. A leader of the uh, third party. Thank you. Chair, I just wanted to, on behalf of everybody in this house, I'm sure give a big thank out to the clerk's office, all of the people around here that support the work that we do and with, without which we wouldn't be able to keep things going. So thank you to everybody associated with this. Thank you, leader of the third party. Shall the section carry? Carry. Government Member's Office, appropriations provided for costs associated with the Government Member's Office, paid from this section are general office expenses, telecommunications, salaries for caucus staff, and the MLA expenses not covered by legislative services. Operations, 743,600. Shall the section carry? Carry. Carry. Total Government Member's Office, 743,600. Shall it carry? Opposition Member's Office, appropriations provided for costs associated with the Opposition Member's Office, paid from this section are general office expenses, telecommunications salaries for caucus staff and MLA expenses not covered by legislative services. Operations, 250000 total Opposition Member's Office, $250,000. Shall it carry? Uh, Leader of the Opposition. So it's more of just a statement of the question. There's a considerable decrease, and I know the reason for that is the, the formula that's presently being used uh, to, to formulate what, what dollars go into um, members' offices. So um, I just want to state here in Hanford that I uh, have asked about this and wanted to have it addressed, and I will continue to do so um, for next year's budget. Thank you, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, leader of the Third Party? What he said. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leader of the Third Party. Shall it carry? Yeah. Okay. Uh, third Party Office. Appropriations provided for costs associated with the Third Party Office. Paid from this section are general office expenses, uh, telecommunications, salaries for caucus staff, and MLA expenses not covered by legislative services. Operations, 185000 Total Third Party Offices, 185000 Shall it carry? Yeah. Total Legislative Services, 4201100 Shall it carry? Yeah. Members, members appropriations provided for payment of remuneration to members of the Legislative Assembly, including basic indemnity, expense allowance, and additional honoraria, as determined by the Indemnities and Allowances Commission. Administration, 15000 Salaries, 2583400 Travel and training, 140000 Total members, 2738400 Shall it carry? Office of the Auditor General, Administration, appropriations provided for operational costs in conducting audits and other examinations. Administration, 39,200. Equipment, 18,000. Materials, supplies, and services, 46,100. Professional services, 40,000. Salaries, 3,033,000. Travel and training, 62,000. Grants, 6,500. Uh, excuse me, uh, total administration, 3,244,800. Shall it carry? Office of the Child and Youth Advocate. Office of the Child and Youth Advocate appropriations provided in support of the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate in accordance with the Child and Youth Advocate Act. Administration, 18,200. Equipment, 10,000. Materials, supplies, and services, 26,700. Professional services, 75,000. Salaries, 9,500,000. Uh, 9, uh, travel and training, 20,200. Total Office of the Child and Youth Advocate, 1,103,100. Shall it carry? Office of the Conflict of Interest Commissioner. Appropriations provided in support of this provision in, uh, of the provisions contained in the Conflict of Interest Act. Salaries, 56,000. Travel and training, 3,500. Total Office of the Conflict of uh, Interest Commissioner, 59,500. Shall it carry? Uh, the Deputy Premier. I have one quick question. Has, is there any, uh, anything in the budget here for the Department of the conflict of interest commissioner to look into why a Fisher person can't be a member of executive council. You had to put me in conflict, didn't you? <laughs> it is well within the uh, budget uh, scope for them to do that, and, and uh, they have done that uh, already. So, Deputy Premier? Has that uh, anything ever been tabled on regards to if that still is, how old is that, and can it be looked at again? This is a budget related question. It is. He asked about the budgeting, the, how much it costs, if there was budget in there. Um, 
the conflict of interest commissioner is uh, you could ask the conflict of interest commissioner for any uh, uh, decision that they've made before and they, I'm sure they could uh, discuss that with you. Deputy Premier. Thank you. Charlotte Carey. Here. Total office of the conflict of interest commissioner, 59500 Charlotte Carey. Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, appropriations provided for costs of carrying out the duties of the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Administration, 8,200. Equipment, 14,200. Material supplies and services, 2,900. Professional services, 20,300. Salaries, 532,100. Travel and training, 8,300. Total Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, $586,000. Uh, shall I carry? Yeah. Total Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, 586000 Shall I carry? Yeah. Office of the Ombudsperson and Public Interest Disclosure Commissioner. Appropriations provided for the operations in support of the responsibilities laid out in the Public Interest, Interest Disclosure and Whistleblower Protection Act and the Ombudsperson Act. Administration, 20000 Equipment, 15000 Material Supplies and Services, 35000 Professional Services, 50000 Salary, 605500 Travel and Training, 20000 Total Office of the Ombudsperson and Public Interest Disclosure Commissioner, 745500 Shall I carry? Total Office of the Ombudsperson and Public Interest Disclosure Commissioner, 740,000, Shall I carry? Elections PEI, appropriations provided for all operational costs associated with the elections office. Administration, 966,500. Equipment, 2,800. Material supplies and services, 12,000. Uh, professional services, 10,000. Salaries, 449,300. Travel and training, 11,600. Total elections, 1,452,200. Total elections PEI, uh, 1,452,200. Shall both carry? Here. Total Legislative Assembly, 14,130,600. Shall it carry? Uh, shall the section, shall the budget carry? Here. Here. And now we do supplementaries. Thank you, stranger. Thank you, speaker. Olivia, I'm going to get a water there, too, if you get a second, please. Uh, yes, please. Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker take the chair and the Chair make report to Mr. Speaker. Uh, shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as Chair of a Committee of the Whole House, I wish to report that the Committee has gone into supply to be granted to His Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon, which said resolutions I am directed to report to the House whenever it should be pleased to receive same. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by um, the Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, that the report of the committee be received. Shall it carry? Here. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Here. Honorable members, a uh, recorded division has been requested. Sergeant Ernst, can you ring the bell? Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, government is ready for the vote. Honourable members, all those voting against the report of the committee, please stand. No. <laughs> yes. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, and the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, and the Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness. Honourable members, all those voting in favour of the report of the committee, please stand. No. <laughs> Honourable Minister of Education and Early Learning and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women, the Honourable Minister of Finance, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Justice Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier, the Honourable Member from Kensington Malpac. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, the Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors, Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, and the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. The Honourable Member from Surrey, Elmira, the Honourable Member from Borden, Kinkora, the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Honourable Members, the report of the Committee and Budget has passed. <laughs> the Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the second order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order number two, consideration of the supplementary estimates in committee. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty. Shall it carry? Carry. I'll ask the member for Charlottetown Winslow to chair. Honourable Members, uh, the House is now in a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supplementary supply to His Majesty. Welcome, Minister. Uh, you have a stranger that you would like to bring onto the floor? Yes, Shall it be granted? Yes. Uh, Honourable Members, we are going to be starting on page 7. Of your supplementary estimates binder. Could I get you to please say your name and your title for Hansard, please? Gordon McFadgen, Executive Director, Fiscal Management. Thank you, Gordon, and welcome. Um, general Government to fund additional operating expenses related to the COVID-19 response, 274000 Health PEI to fund additional operating expenses primarily related to the COVID-19 response, $20,241,300. Transportation and infrastructure to fund grants related to the City of Summerside, Solar Farm and Broadband infrastructure projects, 3,290,000 total special warrants, 23,805,300. Shall it carry? Next honorable members will be turning to page 11.
education and lifelong learning capital to fund additional capital expenditures for school buses, school renovations, and new construction. Total sixteen million thirty thousand. Shall I carry? Uh, leader of the third party. The time, and we'll have the whole fleet turned over to electric buses. Uh, we're we're on a schedule of about. 20 to 25 a year. There's about 400 in total, so I think we have another 10 or so years left. Whoops. Oh, at the rate, rate we're going. Okay. Leader of the third party. That's good. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Shall I carry? Carry. Uh, justice and public safety capital to fund additional capital expenditures related to PICS. Two, radio equipment purchases, the electronic death certificate registry project, and the Correctional Center Women's Unit. Four million seven hundred and sixty-eight thousand four hundred. Shall it carry? Innovation PEI to fund additional operating expenditures related to the administration of the wage rebate for impacted workers program as part of Fiona Response. Four million seven hundred and fifty thousand. Shall it carry? Environment, Energy, and Climate Action to fund additional operating expenditures related to the expanded and new income qualified programs and Fiona response. Twenty million five hundred and seven thousand four hundred. Shall it carry? Sure. Employment Development Agency to fund additional operating expenditures related to the Emergency Jobs Initiative and Special Proje uh, Projects Program. Nine hundred forty thousand three hundred. Shall it carry? Sure. Social Development and Housing to fund additional operating expenditures related to the inflationary supports, Fiona response, and core funding pressures. Thirty-nine million one hundred six thousand three hundred. Shall I carry? Sure. PEI Housing Corporation to fund additional operating expenditures related to inflationary supports and core funding pressures. Five million two hundred eighty thousand eight hundred. Shall I carry? Sure. Total special warrants ninety-one million three hundred eighty-three thousand two hundred. Shall I carry? Sure. Shall the supplementary estimates carry? And you have a script for me. Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair make report to Mr. Speaker. Shall I carry? Shall I carry? Carry. Thank you. No one's good. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole house, I wish to report that the committee has gone into supplementary supply to be granted to His Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon, which said resolutions I am directed to report to the house whenever it should be pleased to receive same. The Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population that the report of the committee be now received. Shall I carry? Honourable members, there has been a request for a recorded division. Uh, Sergeant Ernst, you ring the bell.
Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. Shall it carry? Our members, a recorded division has been requested. The Sergeant at Arbs has rung the bell. Uh, honourable members, all those voting ag against the report, please stand. <coughs> the honourable leader of the third party, the honourable member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the honourable leader of the official opposition, the honourable member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, and the honourable member from Elyria and Vernes. Honourable members, all those voting in favour of the report, please stand. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Years, the Honourable Minister of Finance, the Honourable Deputy Premier, the Honourable Member from Kensington Malpeck, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honourable <coughs> Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, the Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors, the Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, and the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Honourable Members, the report has been adopted. Oh, my apologies, Clerk. <laughs> Didn't need them all. <laughs> the, uh, the Honourable Member from Surrey Almira, the Honourable Member from Borden King Cora, the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. And quickly, I forget my place, eh? <laughs> Honourable members, the uh, uh, report has been adopted. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I moved, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the 15th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? carry. Order number 15. An act to amend the Planning Act, Bill Number 16, ordered for second reading. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this that bill be now read the second time. Shall it carry? Bill Number 16, an act to amend the Planning Act, read a second time. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Sure. I'll ask the Member for Charlottetown Winslow to chair the Committee of the Whole. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled, uh, Bill Number 16, an act to amend the Planning Act. Um, Minister, uh, you have a stranger that you would like to bring onto the floor. Yes. Shall it be granted? Has this been called already for second reading or no? Has it been called already, though? Is it under debate or no? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome. I'll get you to say your name and your title for Hansard, please. Certainly, it's Glenda McKinnon-Peters, the Director of the Land Division with the Department of Housing, Land and Community. Welcome, Glenda. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, did you have a uh, brief comment on the, the bill? And it's uh, uh, Very briefly, um, this is amended to the Planning Act to enable um, 
uh, enforcement of uh, officer, powers. officer powers, yes, so okay. that we can enforce um, some of the provisions of our bylaw. Perfect, thank you. Um, is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill now be read uh, clause by clause, section by section, or open up to general questions? General questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Shall the bill carry? Thank you very much. Thank you. I move, okay, I move the title. Uh, an act to amend the Planning Act. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Being enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Do I need to sign that somewhere? All on the front page. Where's my script? Oh, yeah, here. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration the bill to be intituled an act to amend the Planning Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Carry. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that the 14th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number 14, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, Bill number 14, ordered for second reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said bill be now read the second time. Shall it carry? Bill number 14, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, read a second time. Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Carry. I'll ask the uh, member for Charlottetown Winslow to chair Committee of the Whole. The House is now in committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Income Tax Act. Um, you, uh, Minister, you have a stranger you'd like to bring on the floor? Yep. Shall it be granted? Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Can I get you to say your name and your title for Hansard, please? Uh, Nigel Burns, Director of Economic Statistics and Federal Fiscal Relations of the Department of Finance. Thank you very much and welcome, Nigel. Uh, Minister, did you have a brief uh, note that you'd like to say about uh, the bill's intentions? Yep, so this is the amendment to the Income Tax Act, and it's implementing the first step towards our election commitments outlined in Budget 2023. These steps include increase in the basic personal amount, including the associated spousal amount, the low income tax reduction threshold, and age credit in 2023 and again in 2024. It's also the children's <coughs> wellness tax credit will increase from $1, to $1,000 in 2024. And the existing four bracket system that includes the three explicit brackets plus the surtax that acts like a fourth bracket, will be replaced with a transparent five bracket system in 2024. 14. The proposed brackets are raised and the rates are lowered across the first four brackets. This package of measures will leave more money in the pockets of Islanders. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, is it uh, the pleasure of the committee that the bill now be read clause by clause, section by section, or general questions? Thank you. Leader of the Opposition. Um, basic personal exemption. So you're moving 
awards. Uh, at the 15,000 mark, is that correct? Yes, that's the goal. Leader of the opposition? Oh, sorry. Okay. So, and how many, how long will that take to get to that 15,000? So I think our, our commitment at this point is to get to, um, we're at 12,000 now. We'll be going to 12,750 this year, and then we'll be going to 13,500. And then we're going to reevaluate at that time and, and see if we can take it to the 15,000. Leader of the opposition. But was the commitment during the campaign commitment to go to 15,000? Mm -hmm. So why would you not go to 15,000 here without the increments and without the assurance that we're going to get there? I think we just, we want to do it over the four years. We just want to build in a little bit of a check-in point. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chair. So at the end of four years, you're saying that we would be at 15,000? That's the goal. Nigel, feel free to jump in. So we, interpreting the campaign commitment to get to 15,000, from starting from, from 12, mm -hmm. at the 750 uh, per year increment, would, would get to 15,000 in year four. This bill goes as far as implementing the first two years. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to ask the question again. Why wouldn't you've just gone right to the 15,000 right from the start to make that commitment that, that was uh, in your campaign? I, that, like, that is the goal. Yeah. I think it would. it's wise to maybe just build in a check-in at that point, just because it is two years away, and we just want to be able to take the time to monitor, review, see how everything is going at that time. But the goal is to get to $15,000. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much. So... Uh, I guess this is more as a statement is that uh, I've had many people ask about it and their assumption was that it was going to go to 15 as opposed to these this step process over the years. So what are, in assurance is there that we're going to get to that 15 by the end of four? Is the, obviously with this bill, it only goes to two years. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no assurance that we're going to get to the 15,000 by uh, end of year four. Is that correct? I guess technically um, it's not being built into the income tax. Yep. Um, yeah. It's not being built in at this time, yes. And Nigel, if there's other reasons for that, feel free to chime in. But uh, wary of my position here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, like I don't mind no, I don't want to put you in a bad place, but I, yeah, no, uh, politically and, and we have a platform yeah. to go to fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I guess it was just on uh, in the department's um, um, thought that maybe we just do the first two years maybe in the maybe in the third year we can do it all right um, maybe we can go right to fifteen thousand dollars fifteen thousand in that third year I guess we just wanted to kind of phase it in and have a bit of a check-in after the first two steps leader of the opposition I'll give you one more and then I, and I can put you back in the list sure just need one more and all it is is just that that maybe go to 15 and, and that's my suggestion mm -hmm. not maybe I I do not Approve these steps. Uh, my ask would be that you had went right to fifteen thousand, and I could have brought an amendment forward, but it would just wouldn't have been um, too much work right now. But it may be something that I may be doing in the near future. So thanks. Foreshadowing. Yeah, minister. Can he speak for uh, me? Nigel? Yeah. <laughs> to do it all at once uh, would be a, an increase of uh, three thousand dollars to the basic amount, and that would. It does, there is a cost to that. So phasing it in allows for other priorities to be implemented at the same time. Um, going to th the 15 immediately would cost approximately $30 million, which would compete with other priorities. Uh, Charles, how much royalty? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so if that was going to cost $30 million, what's what's it going to cost to increase the, the wellness from five hundred to 1000 So uh, based on the existing credit, mm -hmm. Uh, we estimate it's about um, $330,000. Charles, how much royalty? So that's what we're, that's what that 
cost us now. So to go up to a thousand, is it safe to say it's it will be? What are you forecasting for that? So um, that the, the cost that I quoted was the the difference. Oh, okay. So it will be a, a, a estimated to cost about six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Show how much royalty, and and I'm I'm all for this. I, I just don't think it's broad enough. I, I don't know, Minister. Wh why didn't we take this and say, make this to families? Why didn't we expand this? If we're talking about, I know thirty million dollars would have been hired, but we're at six hundred and sixty thousand for wellness. Why didn't we look at this? And even though it's going up, we could have strengthened this to to encourage families to be well, to 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 do more across the province. So. Um, why didn't we look at that at this time? I think it was taken into consideration. And I think to, to Nigel's point earlier, I think what they, what they were looking at was all these different pieces to, across demographics and, and um, to ensure that everyone had a piece of that, of, of these tax relief measures. And so um, I think, yeah, I would say that it was considered and it was decided to kind of move everything in steps. Charlotte, how much royalty? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's moving up. I, I just don't think wellness, activity, health, given our, the state of our health care, um, that we can, this is something that for 660, I, I, we just went through an, an IT budget that had this as a consultant fee. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> first I want Islanders to, to use this credit more, but I also think there's gaps with this. I also think that Every child doesn't play organized sports. Every child doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't uh, doesn't have the opportunity to participate. We should be spending upwards of three or four million dollars on this to get everybody healthy across the board. And and I'd like to maybe work with the minister in the future to to do that because here here it is. We opened it up, and I, I, I'm glad that that you went, but at, I don't think we went far enough. So um, uh, I just would like those comments to be on the record. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you, Charles. How much royalty? Leader of the third party. Uh, I appreciated uh, your intervention there, Nigel. I, mm -hmm. um, I figured 30 million was exactly mm -hmm. the reason, the answer to the question, why not now? So, of course, it's always a, you know, we're looking at competing interests. I'm looking at the section seven is where the new tax brackets are created and the adjustments to the existing brackets. And I'm just one simple, well, it's not a simple uh, calculation, but the amount, should, should, hopefully, it's a simple answer. What is the net? change to the Treasury um, with these, with all of these alterations, additions of new tra tax brackets and alterations of rates and others? Go for it. Yeah. So as a package, overall, uh, this year it's estimated to cost about $14 million in, rev in foregone revenue, yep. rising to approximately $20 million next year. Yep. Leader of the third party. Okay. Um, how do the tax brackets that we have created, the five, assume, assuming this bill will pass, um, how do they compare to our neighboring <coughs> jurisdictions in terms of the, where the brackets start and finish and the taxation rate associated with each bracket? That answer will, um, I think perhaps a schedule, we could bring back a schedule. That would be really helpful. Uh, I think it would be difficult for, for me from mm -hmm. here. To uh, provide that to you right okay. now. Leader of the third party? Generally speaking, Nigel, and again, maybe without a schedule, this isn't easy, an easy one to answer, but are, are the, is the way that our tax brackets are, are, um, are developed, is it generally more progressive or less progressive than, let's say, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick? Uh, I think the schedule would be. Well, okay, fair enough. I, I think it might. In to an attempt to try and answer your, your question from, sure. from the seat. I appreciate that. I, I, so the existing um, thresholds are being are, are being increased. They are uh, the rates are being uh, reduced across the, the bottom four brackets, and the intent is to provide more relief at the lower end of the income spectrum. And that's done both through the, the rise in the, the, the basic amount, uh, the spouse equivalent, the low income tax reduction threshold, and a larger reduction in the, uh, the rate in that first bracket. 
Okay. Leader of the third party. Okay. Um, I think I'm good for this section. Okay. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. I appreciate your answers, and I look forward to seeing the schedule. Thanks. Mike. Shall the bill carry? Thanks, Nigel. I move the title. Bill number 14, an act to amend the Income Tax Act. I move the enacting Shall it carry? Oh, I move the enacting clause. Being enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Income Tax Act, uh, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall carry? Carry. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the order number 16 of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Order 16, Appropriation Act, Current Expenditures 2023, Bill Number 17, ordered for second reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move by the Minister of Finance that the said bill be now read the second time. Shall carry. 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 Bill Number 17, Appropriation Act, Capital, sorry, Current Expenditures 2023, read a second time. Deputy Premier. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the House do now resolve itself from the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall carry. carry. The member for Charlottetown Winslow, will you please chair the Committee of the Whole? The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled Bill Number 17, the Appropriation Act, Current Expenditures 2023. Uh, Minister, do you have a stranger that you'd like to bring on the floor? I do so. Shall it be granted? Granted. Good afternoon, stranger. Can you say your name and your title for Hansard, please? Uh, Gordon McFadgen, Executive Director, Fiscal Management. Uh, Minister, do you have a brief statement for the bill or? Uh, this bill just seeks approval for the legislative authority to spend the monies allocated in the budget that was recently tabled. Thank you, Minister. Uh, is it the pledge of the committee that the bill now be read clause by clause or just general questions? Uh, shall the bill carry? Carry. All right. Thanks. Shall the schedule carry? <laughs> I move the title. Uh, uh, the Appropriation Act. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. We, uh, may it please your honour, we, His Majesty's dutiful and loyal servants, the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island, towards appropriating the several supplies raised for the exigencies of His Majesty's government and for other purposes here and after mentioned, do humbly beseech that it be enacted. 
be it therefore enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Am I reading the same one here? I just read this. Yeah, that's what I read. Mr. Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house, having had under consideration a bill to be in to the Appropriation Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move by the Minister of Finance that the order number 17 of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number 17, Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023, Bill number 18, ordered for second reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said bill be now read the second time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 18, Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023, read a second time. Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take in consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Carry. I'll ask the member for Charlotte A. Winslow to chair Committee of the Whole. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to uh, take into consideration a bill to be in titual Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023. Uh, Minister, you have a stranger you'd like to bring on the floor? I do. Uh, shall be granted? Welcome back. Uh, good afternoon again. I'll get you to say your name and your title for Hanser, please. Gordon McFadgen, Executive Director, Fiscal Management. Perfect. Uh, Minister, do you have a brief statement on the bill's intent? This is appropriation, right? This is supplementary. The schedule attached to this act lists the total amount of special warrants approved on the under the authority of the Financial Administration Act since the last sitting of this House. Thank you, Minister. Uh, is it uh, okay to open this up to general questions? Shall the, uh, shall the act carry? carry? Shall Schedule A carry? carry. Shall Schedule B carry? carry. I move the title. Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. Being enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry?
Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intitled the Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shaw Carey? Yeah. The Deputy Premier. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the number six order of the day be now read. Chuck Carey. Order number six, an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act, Bill number five, ordered for second reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said bill now be read the second time. Chuck Carey. Carey. Bill number five, an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act, read a second time. Honourable Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shaw Carey? Carey. Sure. I'll ask the member from Charlottetown Winslow to chair Committee of the Whole. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act. Uh, Minister, I think you have a stranger that you would like to bring on the floor. Uh, shall it be granted? Good afternoon, stranger. Can you say your name and your title for Hansard, please? Ryan Pino, and I'm the Provincial Tax Commissioner. Welcome, Ryan. Uh, Minister, do you have a brief uh, explanation of the bill's intent? So this is the amendment to the Climate Leadership Act. It's going to end the government's application and collection of the carbon levy on fuel products effective June 30th, 2023, due to the Federal Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act coming into effect July 1st, 2023 on PEI. Thank you, Minister. Uh, is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be open to general questions? Uh, are there any questions? Uh, leader of the third party. So these changes are needed because of the, oh, I can put it this way, failure to negotiate successfully with the federal government. Is that, is that correct? Sorry, uh, Leader of the third party, the uh, Minister or the stranger have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, th this is so. Yeah, this is basically the backstop, the federal backstop is coming into play, and sure. and we don't want to double tax the residents' PEI. So. Leader of the third party, and I appreciate that, finance minister. So, who was negotiating this on behalf of the province? Do you know? Uh, it would have been the Department of Environment. Leader of the third party. <coughs> okay. Do you know what the province was looking for during those negotiations? I think I think a big piece was I think part of the argument was and I, I mean obviously I wasn't at the table um, but um, I think um, PEI put forward you know all the good things we're doing to reduce greenhouse gas emission here in PEI I think I think we've done a lot on that relative to the rest of Canada so I think they were trying to put forward what we're doing which um, really is at the outcome of what they're trying to accomplish through this new tax, right? So I think we were trying to establish ourselves as a little bit different. If you look to how we previously had the Climate Leadership Act set out, uh, there was 26 fuels in the Provincial uh, Act, and of those fuels there were exemptions for two in particular, uh, being home heating oil and propane. Yep. Uh, and our understanding is that part of the negotiations was to re retain those exemptions. Uh, for Prince Edward Island, uh, and that was not acceptable as part of the the uh, negotiations. Um, so, under the new Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, those fuels do have a, a rate associated with them, as opposed to our existing. Right. Leader of the third party, is it your expectation that the ultimately this Climate Leadership Act will be sort of redundant as things are removed, Ryan? 
Yeah, so the reason we didn't go to a full repeal at this point in time is because we will still have some audit obligations to run out as people get their final uh, returns filed leading up to the July 1st okay. period. So what we've done is essentially any clauses that would have imposed the levy or imposed a reporting uh, mechanism beyond July 1st, we've, we've effectively made those sunset left the other provisions in so that we can carry out our final administration of the act and in the future presumably we will seek to repeal what remains of that act after we've completed those but we have some obligations under our, our international fuel tax agreement to complete uh, certain audits as part of that so so we have to run out that program first okay leader of the third party thanks chair so are you imagining ryan that that will be in the next fiscal year that the repeal will have because uh, practically there'll be no parts of this that will be yeah, we'll have, uh, we've got a couple of years as our, our window of, of completing those audits on those prior years. Yeah. So depending on how fast we can get through the required audits of those periods, uh, we could see it in the next fiscal, but it, it, it could be a couple of years before we fully repeal the act. Okay. Read of the third part. Uh, maybe this is more to the minister than Ryan, but I mean, either could answer. What, what do you feel that we're losing through sort of um, handing over control of carbon pricing to the federal government? Well, we're, I guess we're losing our made in, made in PEI solution mm -hmm. that we had and we felt worked. Um, I, I think that's what we're losing here. Yeah. yeah. Leader of the third party. Is there anything you feel you would have done differently if we could have maintained control? That's a tough question to answer, um, given my relative rookiness and not having been in those conversations. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to say what could have been done different sitting in this chair right now. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So we originally were planning a number, we were funding, sorry, a number of programs through some of the money that we received from the federal government. And I'm wondering what impact the imposition of the federal backstop will have on the provincial treasury and therefore our ability to continue to fund those programs? Our budgeted revenue for prior year was $31,630,000, I think, for uh, the year ended 2022-2023. Uh, for the current fiscal year, that has declined to, because we're, we're only going to impose the tax to July 1st, uh, I believe it's $8.2 million. Um, so, so really, by the time next year rolls around, that that thirty-one million becomes zero. Right. Uh, as we move towards that, there will be a little bit of carbon revenue that retains on the province's financial statements, uh, because we still, as part of the uh, large emitter program, the output-based uh, emitter program, uh, we still receive the carbon uh, from the federal government who administers it on our behalf. Uh, but I think in in prior years it, it'd be less than a million dollars of ongoing carbon revenue from that aspect of the program. Okay. So leader of the third party, I'll give you one more and then I can put you back on the list. Yeah, and I really only have one more question for this and it's uh, a clarification. I'm hoping Ryan can explain this for the benefit of, of Islanders. Whether the 14 cent increase in the federal carbon levy means that that will be a net 14 cent increase in the price of gasoline here on PEI. Uh, no, so if, if you look at what our current makeup of the price of a litre of gasoline is, uh, on a litre of gasoline there's 11.05 cents of Provincial Climate uh, Leadership Act carbon levy, yep. which we will be repealing as part of this yep. should this bill pass. So, and this bill is has an effective date of July 1st. Mm -hmm. So on July 1st, the 11 0.05 should come off the 14.31 from the federal greenhouse gas pollution pricing act will come in so price at the pumps based on that differential would go up by 3.26 cents great chair i just i just that's a really yeah, really important point yeah that that we emphasize that right. this this is not a 14 cent increase we're replacing a, an 11 point something cent tax right now with a 14 so the net is three per three cent increase per liter of gasoline for islanders on july 1st Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Leader of the Third Party. The Honourable Member from Borden, Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the question is, we're talking carbon tax, but this has nothing to do with the clean fuel regulations. Am I right in saying that? Correct. Yeah, that's different. The next uh, thing is Borden, this. Borden, Kinkora. Thank you, Chair. The next thing is, 
we know that the carbon tax, when one, one tax replaces the other, gas is going to go up at the pump by three point some cents. Correct. We tried to negotiate with the federal government, and the federal government refused to recognize the needs of islanders and how we use home heating fuel and propane to heat our house. Is that correct? Yes. Warden Concora. That's correct, right? Okay. Now, do we have any idea what the clean fuel regulations are going to mean to islanders going forward when New Brunswick has already signaled that it's going to be a minimum of eight cents, not counting the HST recalculation at the pump? Do we have any idea what it's going to be? I mean, that's separate from what we're here discussing today. Um, I, I think that's something we can handle and at another level, but I mean, yeah, you've brought it up in the house um, a couple of times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think everyone understands that there's going to be significant impact there, and I, and I understand why you're bringing it up because there is going to be an impact there. Um, but as far as what we're discussing here today, I just would hate to confuse it um, with what we're trying to discuss here today, which is the carbon tax. And so I just worry about confusing the issue. That's the only thing. I'll just, uh, Board and Concora. I'll just end with this. Thank you, Chair. You said it right a second ago. There is going to be significant, I understand what we're here for today, but there is going to be significant increase, and you stated it, coming July 1st, when the carbon tax and the clean fuel regulations hit the pumps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, shall the Act carry? Alright, I should know it by now. I move the title. An Act to amend the Climate Leadership Act shall it carry. I move the enacting clause. Uh, being enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as Chair of a Committee of the Whole House, having had, uh, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the fifth order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order number five, an act to amend the Revenue Administration Act, Bill number four, ordered for second reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Health and Wellness, that the second, the, the said bill be now read the second time. Shall it carry? Here. Bill number four, an act to amend the Revenue Administration Act, read a second time. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Health and Wellness, that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take in consideration the said bill. Shall that carry? Here. I'll ask the member from Charlotte Winslow to chair the Committee of the Whole. Uh, the House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Revenue Administration Act. Minister, you have a stranger you'd like to bring on the floor? I do. Shall it be granted? You do have a stranger? I do, yep. So the stranger for this department can make their way onto the floor. Who are 
While the uh, stranger's making their way onto the floor, uh, when we do go into debate, will we open it up to general questions? Does that work for everybody? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> a little, roll, a little uh, pit stop there on the way through here. Uh, I'll get you to say your name and your title for Hanser, please. Ryan Pino, the Provincial Tax Commissioner. Awesome. Uh, Minister, is there a brief introduction of the bill's intent? So this is an amendment to the Revenue Administration Act, um, and it's going to clarify the process for an appointment of the provincial uh, appointment of the provincial tax commissioner, as well as inspectors, for purposes of the Act and other revenue acts, as defined in the Revenue Administration Act. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. Are there any questions, Leader of the Third Party? Questions on this? The Act uh, specifies that the provincial tax commissioner be appointed by the cabinet. And can you explain how that's different from the current process that we use? Uh, the current process is just not defined. So the current process is that there shall be a provincial tax commissioner, uh, but it doesn't say how that comes to be. So this process just codifies the existing practice. Leader of the third party. Yeah, right. So in the past, there's, we've had discussions about moving certain jobs away from being cabinet appointments and letting the minister uh, hire or appoint that person, her or himself because it's a speedier, easier process. Yep. And I'm wondering what the reason behind leaving this with, or I shouldn't say leaving it yep. with cabinet, specifying the cabinet should do this. So the hiring process is your typical PSC hiring process. I believe my, my understanding uh, from legal counsel is that the reason it's still there is because I'm appointed under the acts to act on behalf of the minister. So that's where I get the authority to do that. Okay. Leader of the third party. Okay. So. If it's a cabinet appointment, but I'm wondering what that means to the tenure of the employee. Are they, you know, are they permanent or do they serve at the pleasure of cabinet? What's the? I hope I like to think that I'm a permanent employee. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's not. It's not. Time, I have a longer. I, no, it is. It's a permanent employee, but the appointment happens by virtue of the act in order to, uh, in order to, give that power. So you are hired as the provincial tax commissioner. Yep. Uh, in the typical hiring yep. process, and then appointed as the provincial tax commissioner, separate and apart from that. So the, there is a a, a PS, er, there is a, a PQ for the provincial tax commissioner. Yeah. So you're hired as that commissioner. It's not an appointment, but then that tax commissioner who's hired gets appointed under the act. So like yeah. parallel leader of the third party. No, I'm fine. I, I, Ryan has, as usual, explained it perfectly. <laughs> Little in like self-interest that I continue as the provincial tax commissioner in this act. <laughs> 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 Shelby I carry? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. I move the title. An act to amend the Revenue Administration Act. Shall I carry? I move the enacting clause. Being enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall I carry? Sure. Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall I carry? Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled the Act to Amend the Revenue Administration Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move by the Minister of Finance that the eighth order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number eight, an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act, Bill number six, ordered for second reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said bill be now read the second time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number six, an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act, read a second time. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism and Parks and Rec, that the House do now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shaw Carey. I'll ask the uh, member for Charlton wins to chair Committee of the Whole.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act Bill Number 6. Uh, Minister, do you have multiple strangers you'd like to bring onto the floor? Yes. Shall it be granted? Yes. Good afternoon. Hello, no stranger to me, but I'll get you to say your name and your titles for uh, Hansard. Uh, my name is Jaylee Grady. I'm the manager of Victim Services. Blair Barber, legislative specialist with Justice and Public Safety. Perfect. Uh, Minister, do you have a brief uh, general statement for the bill's intent? I'll leave that to the strangers. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, this bill, uh, very quickly. Uh, amends the Victims of Crime Act to expand the maximum number of representatives on the Victim Services Advisory Committee to allow for greater inclusion of community representation. And second, it protect, better protects victim service records from being accessed by third parties. Thank you very much, Blair. Um, so is it uh, the pleasure of the committee that the bill be opened up to general questions? General questions. Perfect. Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah. From 15 to 20, and to, it's to promote. Is it? Is it? What's the, What's the goal of that? And are these going to be targeted positions for different communities? Uh, the committee itself has raised concerns that we don't have um, enough space to uh, allow for a, a more diverse group to participate. So, uh, hoping to rather than as terms expire that we're, we're losing representation from certain organizations or communities that we're able to include more people at the table. Charlton West Royalty. Can I get anything more specific? Like what are we targeting for in terms of community or groups or, or people or yeah? Yeah, um, so there are currently um, there are some organizations that are required to be there. Um, things like probation services, court services, uh, police, um, and then the rest of the positions are currently made up of various organizations. Um, so some of those include uh, Immigrant and Refugee Services, um, the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center, Child and Family Services, Family Violence Prevention, uh, Community Legal Information. Um, we would like to include more, uh, more specialized representation around mental health. Um, services to bring that voice to the table, um, more youth focused services, uh, representation from gender diverse uh, communities, uh, BIPOC Usher, uh, the Humane Society has come up um, as a suggestion, MAD PEI has uh, requested um, consideration at the table, uh, Pride, Peers Alliance, there are a number of um, suggestions um, to start to increase some diversity at the table. Charlton West Royalty. Changing the act is one thing, but how are we going to how are we going to make sure that we're going to encourage those groups to 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 get there? Is there some kind of a campaign to, to get us there? Uh, we will reach out. I was waiting for this to <laughs> to, to, to go through before I started doing that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wasn't sure it was going to happen. So um, I, the committee, the chair of the committee, um, and myself will both be. Uh, connecting to various community resources and asking for um, participation. Charlottetown West Royalty. It will, uh, increasing it to 20 won't dilute the, the it, it's it's only going to enhance, correct? It's, it's yeah. Um, and my, la my last question. Yeah, um, so far, sorry. Yeah, and it just something to consider, like outside of this bill, when I was just talking about it was today, it was an important day that we have an action plan on race and, and, um, and wh where we're going. Um, I was just chatting about there, there. There's some definitions that I'd like you to consider in the in the future in the Police Act and the different things that aren't there currently, and, and that was brought to my attention. So that's something that I'll be looking into in the future, and I'll maybe like to get the minister's support on that, just to to strengthen things around. Um, you know, racism isn't even defined um, in in various acts that need to be so. One of, the, um, <clears throat> one of the purposes of the Victim Services Advisory Committee is to be able to uh, make recommendations to the minister. Uh, so that would be a great resource to be able to move some of that forward. Great, thank you. Thank Shall you. I have much relevance? Thank you. All right, thank you. Shall the act carry? Carry. carry. 
you. Thank you, Blair. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Blair. Yeah, you got like two minutes. You have to wait. I move the title. Uh, an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. Be enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and the, the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the 16th order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order 16, Appropriation Act, Current Expenditures, 2023, Bill Number 17, ordered for third reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said bill be now read the third time. Shall I carry? Here. Bill Number 17, Appropriation Act, Current Expenditures, 2023, read a third time. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that the said bill do now pass. Shall I carry? Yes. Honourable Members, a recorded division has been requested. Sergeant at Arms, please ring the bell. All right, members, all those voting against the bill passing, please stand. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, and the Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. All those voting in favour of the bill, please stand. The Honourable Minister of Education, the Honourable Minister of Finance, the Honourable Deputy Premier, the Honourable Member from Kensington Malpeck, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honourable Minister of Tourism, Sport and Culture and Fisheries, the Honourable Member of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, the Honourable Member for Housing, Land and Communities, the Honourable Member for Health and Wellness, the Honourable Member from Borden Kinkora. The Honourable Member, pardon me, the Honourable Member from Surrey, Elmira, the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Honourable Members, the bill has passed. <laughs> Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the 17th order of the day be now read. Shall carry? Carry. Order number 17, Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023, order, or Bill number 18, ordered for third reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that the said bill be now read the third time. Shall it carry? Carry. 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 
Bill number 18, Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023, read a third time. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said bill do now pass. Shall it carry? Carry. Yes. This is a bill introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to a committee of the whole House, reported, agreed to without amendment, read a third time, and is now moved that the bill do now pass. All those in favour, say yea. Yay. Contrary, nay. Nay. The bill has passed. The Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the 3rd, 5th, 6th, 8th, 14th, and 15th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number three, an act to amend the Regulated Health Perfection, Professions Act, Bill number two, ordered for third reading. Order number five, an act to amend the Revenue Administration Act, Bill number four, ordered for third reading. Order number six, an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act, Bill number five, ordered for third reading. Order number eight, an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act, Bill number six, ordered for third reading. Order number 14, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, Bill number 14, ordered for third reading. Order number 15, an act to amend the Planning Act, Bill number 16, ordered for third reading. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said bills be now read the third time with unanimous consent where required. Shall it carry? Carry. carry. Bill number two, an act to amend the Regulated Health Professions Act, read a third time. Bill number four, an act to amend the Revenue Administration Act. Bill number four, read a third time. Bill number five, an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act, read a third time. Bill number six, an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act, read a third time. Bill number 14, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, read a third time. Bill number 16, an act to amend the Planning Act, read a third time. The Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said bills do now pass. Shall it carry? Carry. These are bills introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to committees of the whole House, reported agreed to uh, without, with and without amendment, as the case may be read a third time, and it is now moved that the bills do now pass. All those in favor, say yea. Yay. Contrary, nay. The bills have passed. Deputy, Spe Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, before I read this, I, I want to thank uh, particularly today our House leaders, uh, Kensington Malpeck and uh, leaders, House leaders across for uh, uh, making this happen today. And I want to thank all members for their hard work. And uh, I think we, uh, with the, the midnight sessions, we really, uh, we really earned our pay here. And uh, good work to everyone. Um, and I want to wish all the best to uh, the Madam Speaker. Uh, she might, hopefully she's watching. At this time, I wish to advise that this concludes the business that government wishes to conduct during the spring sitting. Honorable members, I have been advised that the Honorable Lieutenant Governor will arrive at the Coles Building shortly. I will now leave the Chair and invite Her Honour the Lieutenant Governor to join us in the Chamber to receive the House and its address in reply to the speech from the throne and to grant royal assent to the various bills passed by this House.
Your Honor, the Lieutenant Governor of Prince Edward Island requests permission to enter the chamber. May it please your honor, we, His Majesty's dutiful and loyal subjects of the Legislative Assembly of the province of Prince Edward Island at this time in session assembled, beg leave to offer our humble thanks for the gracious speech with which we, your honor was pleased to open the present session. Mr. Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly, it is a pleasure for me to be with you to receive your address in reply to the speech from the throne with which I opened the present session of the Legislative Assembly. I thank you for the careful consideration which you have given to the matters contained in the speech, as well as the address which you have presented to me. Your Honour. The Legislative Assembly has passed certain bills during this, the first session of the 67th General Assembly, and now begs your honors consideration of the grant of royal assent for the following bills. Bill number two, an act to amend the Regulated Health Professions Act. Bill number four, an act to amend the Revenue Administration Act. Bill number five, an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act. Bill number six, an act to amend the Victims of Crime Act. Bill number 14, an act to amend the Income Tax Act. Bill number 16, an act to amend the Planning Act. Bill number 18, Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023. Bill number 104, an act to amend the Ombudsperson Act. In His Majesty's name, I assent to these bills. May it please your honor, we, His Majesty's loyal and dutiful subjects of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, in session assembled, approach your honor at the close of our labors with sentiments of unfeigned devotion and loyalty to His Majesty's person and government. We do humbly beg for your honor's acceptance of a bill to be intitulated, the Appropriation Act, uh, Current Expenditures, 2023 thus placing at the disposal of the Crown the means by which government can be made efficient for the service and welfare of the province. Her Honour, the Honourable Lieutenant Governor, doth thank His Majesty's loyal and dutiful subjects, accepts their benevolence and assents to this bill in His Majesty's name. I wish to commend all honourable members for the conscientious manner in which you have conducted your deliberations to this point of the first session of the 67th General Assembly of Prince Edward Island. Je tiens à vous exprimer ma reconnaissance pour votre dévouement au bien-être des insulaires. Je vous souhaite une saison estivale tout à fait divertissante. At this time, I pray that until the Legislative Assembly again meets, each of you enjoy good health and prosperity, and that peace and freedom for all people shall be nearly achieved. I do wish you a safe and most enjoyable summer. The Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move, second by the Honourable Deputy Premier, that this House adjourn and stand to the call of the Speaker. Honourable Members, I just want to thank you uh, for your patience with the uh, the new uh, 
the, the interim uh, speaker. Uh, our thoughts are with the Madam Speaker and her family, of course, to this summer. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you to the new members as well. Uh, thank you to the pages, to the clerk, a deputy clerk, and all of their staff. Uh, enjoy, I know it won't be a, a slow summer, but enjoy your constituencies. Shall I carry? Carry.